Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Budget Committee meeting for Tuesday, April 2nd. It is 9.30 in the morning. My name is Paul Russell, and I represent Lower Sackville, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. I'd also like to acknowledge that the Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional and unceded lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaty signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. The next item on the order of business is the approval of the minutes of February 28th, March 1st, and March 6th, 2024. Can I have a motion? Thank you, Councillor Cuddle, seconded by uh, Councillor Lovelace. Are there any errors or omissions in those minutes? Seeing none, all in favour of the minutes, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Great, those minutes pass. Next item on the agenda is the approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions. Over to the clerk. Do we have any changes? There are no changes to this meeting from the clerk's office. Great, thank you. Can I have a motion to approve the order of business as presented then? Thank you, Councillor Daigle Gammon, seconded by the mayor. Um, are there any changes from the committee? Not seeing any all in favor of the order of business as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Great, we have an order of business. Call for declaration of conflict of interest. Not seeing any. The next item on the agenda is public participation, and this is uh, this is a, a, a great part of the meeting where we get to hear from the public. Any member of the public is able to step forward and address the budget committee for five minutes. And do we have any uh, people who have signed up? No one signed up prior to this meeting today. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, in that case, I will call for three times for any member of the public who would like to step forward and address the Budget Committee. <coughs> Feel free to uh, have a seat at the mic in the centre, sir. Thank you. Here we go. Am I right? Yep, yeah. you have five minutes. Go ahead, please introduce yourself and state the community uh, that you live in. Yeah, uh, my name is Douglas Botchett. Uh, I, I'm on the board of directors with Glen Arbor Homeowners Association. Um, I'm, I'm here to speak on behalf of making Station 50 a, a permanent uh, fire station. It's critical to, uh, to our infrastructure. Uh, our, our community uh, alone represents uh, 327 households, probably 650 voters. <coughs> station 50 services, not, not not only our uh, our area, but but uh, it was tr strategically established uh, halfway between 103 and and, Bed and Bedford Highway uh, as as a, as a, to, to service that whole area. It services uh, White Hills, of course, <coughs> and, and and all the communities um, be, be to, between the 103 and, and Bedford. It's it's absolutely critical to to our area. Uh, when when you had the wildfires last year. Station 65 could not respond. I, I was down there at the, at the time of the fire. The, the road was blocked. Uh, any, any stations uh, th that could respond uh, were, were at least uh, uh, 12 kilometers further away than, than Station 50. Uh, station 50 services as well, but it, it needs to be a 24-7 operation. Uh, and and <coughs> we talked to the people there. We support them there. Our community, um, um, put in a, uh, a widescreen uh, TV for them in their training area as a thank you. We, we, we give them a, a do donation each year uh, of $500. They usually use that to, uh, for, for, for the children at Christmas time. They're, they're a lovely bunch of people. They, they attend our meetings. Unfortunately, it's used as a training station and, and the chiefs rotate. So, so we, we get to know one and, and the next thing you know, he's gone, another one's in there. But uh, it, it, the station 50 is absolutely critical. If I understand you're, you're, you're looking at either making 50 or 65 a permanent station. 65 could not service our area. <coughs> That's pretty, okay. mu pretty much what I got to say. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any members of the committee that have a question for you, so thank you very much. We will take that into consideration as we move forward today and possibly tomorrow. Are there any other members of the public who would like to step forward and address the Budget Committee? 
second time. Are there any other members of the public who would like to step forward and address the Budget Committee this morning? And third and final time, are there any members of the public who would like to step forward and address the Budget Committee at this time? Okay, thank you very much. I do appreciate, uh, I do appreciate the comments. Moving ahead, we have the 2024-25 Budget Committee Adjustment List for consideration. Um, this is going to open with a presentation from the CAO. Flanked by a number of members of the finance staff. CAO, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of Budget Committee. And uh, you'll see I'm accompanied today by a number of finance staff and also staff from operational business units who will be available to answer questions. And today we're looking for the final direction to finalize the 2024-25 operating budget. Moving to the next slide, a history of where we've come. In November, we indicated that the average annual uh, tax burden may need to increase by as much as 15%. And we have been using the term average annual tax burden at Halifax Regional Municipality for a number of years. It is a um, government finance officers association best practice to some extent to look at your increase in your tax burden and be transparent about it rather than just referring to the increase in the uh, tax rate which is what a lot of other municipalities do focus on. Focusing just on what's going on with the rate really minimizes, you know, how the impact is reported. So throughout this presentation, we're going to give you some information on both average tax burden and what's going on with the rate. So in November, we indicated a 15% increase in municipal taxes was required to meet council priorities. By January, um, based on your direction and the work of staff, we were able to reduce the projected increase in average tax burden to 8.9%. And that came from a combination of items that are shown on this slide, the largest of which was a reduction in capital from operating funding of $30 million, $7 million reduction in reserve contributions, $3.6 million in various operating expense reductions and $2.1 million in uh, operating revenue increases. So that was January. Moving to the next slide, it gives you where we are now. And by the end of March, we're, we're able to state with confidence that we could reduce the proposed municipal tax increase to 8% with the acceptance of the budget adjustment list recommendations that are in this report. Now, the overall tax increase is reduced to 6.2%, and the municipal tax rate would increase by 0.009 or 1.18%. The average residential tax bill would be increasing by $185, which works out to about $15.42 per month. And I'll now explain how we have arrived at this amount. Going to the next slide, you will see that the largest change between January and March relates to change in what we need to pay to the provincial government for mandatory contributions. So a service exchange memorandum of understanding was signed just last week between the province and the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, which means we no longer have to pay correction services and housing. So in total, that is a $12.1 million uh, savings for the municipality next year. However, that savings for us is offset by the fact that mandatory education contributions 
are increasing by an amount that is larger than that reduction. Still, we really appreciate this. It's a good first step, and we know that uh, there will be a second phase of service exchange discussions, and education funding is on the list of items for future discussion. So we're very pleased to have been part of the initial service exchange and that Halifax Regional Municipality was included. So moving to the next slide, we also have some additional proposed budget changes and adjustments that staff are taking the initiative to bring forward. The first of which is a increase in the projected permit revenue of $2 million. This is a somewhat more aggressive uh, estimate than we had been previously using. We are also proposing to reduce the operating costs of capital budget, and that's in recognition of the timing of the completion of some capital projects. We don't think we'll need as much operating cost of capital uh, for 24-25. We also are proposing, uh, for some capital projects, looking at when they will actually be delivered, that we can reduce capital from operating funding. It means that we will have to pay the capital from operating funding next year, but those projects would still be proceeding. It's just that we're not paying the bill till next year and we wouldn't budget for it for next year. So an example of that would be the corporate accommodations project, the municipal police uh, fleet replacement amount, and the uh, environmental and general building uh, capital from operating decreases. So you can see on that table, there's three items that are labeled capital from operating decrease. Those are really timing shifts. Um, and streetscaping and tactical urbanism, the $700,000 capital project there, that is again a recognition that we don't think that can be delivered this year, so we're shifting that project uh, forward to next year. The other items on this slide that are being brought forward as a result of us digging as deep as we could <laughs> to try to mitigate the tax increase next year, we're proposing that uh, the $1.1 million contribution we normally make to the Central Library Replacement Reserve be paused for this year. And we're also proposing that a uh, regional library upgrades capital project be funded from that reserve to the tune of $600,000 rather than funding it through capital from operating funding. Looking at our overall reserve strategy is something that finance is going to be doing this year. And our preliminary assessment, these, there is only one asset currently that has its own distinct replacement reserve, and that would be the Central Library. Uh, it's a little bit unusual when you look at the fact that um, that building is not um, going to need to be replaced for several years, and you're taxing and collecting money well in advance of when you will require it. So we want to look at different um, ways to plan and fund for replacement of our um, significant assets and do that in the context of the overall reserve strategy. Moving to the next slide. There were a number of uh, budget adjustment list items that through the budget process, council approved being added to the list. Um, they total about $3.4 million um, on a net basis of additional funding that would be added to the budget if they were all approved. There are two reductions also on that list that staff had identified and council approved being added to the budget adjustment list. So of the 14 uh, adjustments recommended um, or by council, staff are recommending we proceed with 13 of them at this time. There's one that we do not recommend proceeding with at this time. Moving to the next slide, uh, we are recommending we proceed with the transit fare increase that was included in the additional, the initial budget. 
It's a, a 25 cent increase and the details are in briefing note uh, 007. It's an increase that's in line with other Atlantic Canadian municipalities. It is going to be used to help fund a service expansion this year because we'll be expending an additional $2.2 million for the Moving Forward Together plan. And the other consideration is that removing the transit fare increase would shift about $700,000 onto the general rate that would be paid for all taxpayers. So it shifts uh, a cost from transit users onto all taxpayers of the municipality if we put it on the general rate. Moving to the next slide. Just some considerations for future budgets. Um, we are expecting next year we'll see a six to seven percent increase in average tax burden required to maintain service levels. Expenditure increases in the neighborhood of 35 to 45 million dollars for existing services. This does not include any new municipal services and does not include any operating costs for new assets that might get added this year. We are expecting that deed transfer tax is going to begin to moderate. It's fluctuated in recent years. We are expecting that uh, we will have capital from operating requirements that have been removed from this year's budget that we will need to add back in if we want to maintain the state of good repair for our existing assets. We also uh, recognize that we've used some one-time funding or deferred some cost, uh, which will add further pressure to taxes in 2025-26. And we also need to do the overall review of reserve funding strategy, which I mentioned earlier in the context of the Central Library. So this slide talks about the negatives that concern us about the future budget. I will say there are some positive things that I want Council to, to keep in mind. The fact is that we will have future service exchange discussions. I do believe that some of the dialogue around a new deal for cities that's being promoted through the Federation of Com Canadian Municipalities and the Big City Mayor's Caucus is beginning to find traction. And I do know that there will be increased in new uh, funding programs from other levels of government, particularly in the area of programs and infrastructure that support housing, public transit, water and wastewater. So there are, you know, positive unknowns on the horizon also. Next slide talks about debt. Our debt is increasing. Our ability to pay debt also increases every year and our debt service ratio is still well in hand with where it should be. But what's of a little bit of concern is that the portion of the capital budget that is funded by debt um, historically used to be between 15 to 20 percent per year and it's now being relied on more heavily to fund the growing capital plan. In the upcoming year, 48% of the capital plan will be funded using debt. The portion of debt used in the capital plan will continue to rise and within two years will exceed 50%. This will result in higher future debt service costs and future tax increases will soon be driven by debt servicing costs. It's also worth noting that the current two to four year capital plan has some unfunded costs also that will either impact capital from operating or future debt requirements. And moving to the next slide, this chart shows our expected principal and interest costs to service the debt used in funding the capital plan. With a growing reliance on debt to fund the capital plan, beginning in 2026-27, this will drive a 2% increases in taxes annually. So in conclusion, we know that increasing uh, population, increasing demands for service, inflation and aging infrastructure are going to continue to put pressure on the budget. But we believe the recommendations put forward today balance a concern for affordability with a reasonable level of municipal services. And I believe that is the last slide and we now look forward to your questions. 
Thank you very much, CAO. Um, first on the list is the mayor. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nice to see you uh, back up there. Uh, I know you won't be with us all day, but it's good to see you with us today. Um, CAO, uh, Jerry, uh, Finance, thank you very much. I'll put the motion on the floor um, that the Budget Committee direct CAO to one finalize a proposed operating uh, budget for the Regional Council that includes items BAL 01 through items BAL, BAL 05 and 7 through 14 from the budget adjustment list and attachment A of the staff report March 27th to be added, removed two from the 24-25 proposed operating budget, two finalize the proposed operating budget, including the budget revisions, BAL 16 to BAL 21 as listed in the budget adjustment list schedule in attachment A of the staff report March 27, 24. Three finalize the capital plan for regional council that includes BAL 13B from the budget adjustment list schedule in attachment A to be added to the 24-25 approved plan. This recommendation will result in an average municipal tax bill increase of 8%. Thank you. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Blackburn. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. My, my first comment is that I'm surprised to see 8%. Everything else tells us it's 6.2%. What is the b bill going to go up? Is it going to be on average 8% or 6.2%? It's going to go up by 6.2%. The uh, municipality has a number of different rates that get set by regional council when the final budget is approved. And the municipal portion is what we normally refer to as the general tax rate or the mill rate. Um, but a good portion of our bill is mandatory contributions to the provincial government, which are collected by area rates essentially. And the net impact on the average residential tax bill is 6.2%. I think this recommendation should reflect that because that's what's going to get the attention. It does say on page three, with the recommended bill and these changes, the proposed total residential tax bill impact decreases to 6.2%. Um, and so I think I'd like to, is it, would it be in, in motion, uh, in, in order to propose an amendment that suggests the recommendation will result in an average total residential tax bill impact of 6.2%. Is that in order, Mr. Clerk, Mr. Chair, Mr. Lawyer? I would think it's in order, but I also think it's not necessary because we are just at the beginning of changing whatever that number is. Yeah, but that's where we are. We're at the beginning, correct? Is it in order? It, it is, it, it's, it's not part of the motion per se, but it clarifies what the residential rate would be. I would suggest though that we wait till the end of the bowel discussion and if there's any other additions that might change that, then we can get the number, sure, number I'll, set I'll do at that, that I'll point. wait, I'll wait, because I don't want to have a lot of speaking on just on that piece, but we did start at eight and we, we, it should say we're starting at 6.2 today in my view. You know, we kind of go out of our way to, uh, uh, beat ourselves up a little bit when it comes to some of the budget stuff. And, um, you know, when I look at what other ta cities are doing, you know, some are able to manage it, some aren't, but 6.2 is not terribly unreasonable and it's a lot better than 8 and it actually, you know, reflects the fact that we are getting some of these charges that we don't have to uh, put on our tax bill anymore. But the big one from the, from the province that flows through is increasing more than the, uh, housing and corrections that are coming off. I think that's more accurate. But I'll, I'll wait and uh, see where we go on that. Um, second question, uh, Kathy, is on the issue of um, the um, Central Library Reserve funding. You spoke to it a little bit. Um, we're suggesting not to do the payment of 1.1 million. How much is in that fund? Through the chair to uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, approximately $16 million. So the $16 million in the Central Library Reserve funding for recapitalization, one assumes? That is correct. It's for recapitalization of the Central Library. Do you want to say something? Uh, uh, Tyler Higgins, uh, Manager of Budget Reserves. Sorry to correct the CAO, but it's actually $11 million next year. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's $11 million. Okay. And do we have a sense of when that would need to be used? I believe 
it really depends on when the central library needs to be recapitalized or replaced. So That's kind of what I'm that. asking you. <laughs> 30 years? What's that? 30 years. I believe that was what was written in the business case at the time. Yeah. So, yeah, it could be, yeah, 20 years from now, I guess. Okay. Yeah, which could be extended longer depending upon the lifespan of the building yeah. and what means. Well, I certainly would support, you know, not putting money into something that doesn't need to be recapitalized in the near future. And I wonder if there isn't some of that 11 million that could be uh, used today um, uh, on that as well. But I'm going to see where the discussion goes on that. Um, thank you. That's what I have for now. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. It was interesting to me that it was the Chamber of Commerce that came before us a month ago and said, look at debt. Look at your debt. You have debt room. Normally, that's not what you expect from a business organization. But I think it's, you know, businesses do manage and use debt when things are, when it's necessary to do so. So I think we have increased our debt ceiling per person to 1,800. Is that a person? It, I think. That is correct, and additionally, we've looked at, in this final review of the capital budget, um, we have looked at all of the projects that could be financed by debt in terms of being eligible for debt, and essentially everything that we could debt fund is debt funded. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, CAO and Tyler. Um, before we proceed, I just want to say thank you very much to the committee for all of the work that you have done in my absence. Uh, it, there has been a phenomenal amount of work done and I really appreciate um, what you've done to try and keep the numbers uh, in line. As we proceed, we have tried a number of different mechanisms in the past, putting half a dozen items on, the, uh, on, on a motion for, um, uh, for an amendment at once or, or trying one item at a time. And it has always come back to let's do one budget adjustment list item at a time or in extremely logical cases two, but not more than two. So with that, let's proceed. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Was that uh, aimed at me in particular? <laughs> no, I really appreciate seeing you in that chair. It's great to have you back today. Um, and thank you, Kathy, for this presentation. Um, I know that it's uh, an awful lot of work. Certainly it was, uh, you know, um, working until midnight. Uh, I'm, I'm sure many, many days waiting to know uh, when this historic agreement was going to be signed, if at all, with the province uh, for the service exchange. So it is good to know that I think you, uh, I'm going to quote you here, positive unknowns on the horizon. <laughs> so, um, you know, there are, there are lots of unknowns and uh, they go back to you know having a strong relationship with the province which I think we've been getting better at and I appreciate the work that you've been putting into that uh, but yet we still don't have our traffic safety act regulations we still don't have our coastal protection act that's been thrown out the window um, so I, I do think that we've we still have a lot of work to do in order to move forward positively for property taxpayers in that tax bill to look at the education area rate in particular um, and that being said, we know that we have overcrowded schools. So thinking about how we're going to move forward with having a transparent conversation with the province about school siting. Um, on that note, uh, you know, when, when we hopefully move forward to having a new historic agreement with the province for HRM01 and the transferring of more and more provincial roads, it's, um, you know, it's, it's surprising to me that we have this one ca uh, capital reserve fund for Central Library, but never any money set aside for HRM01. So that when those roads and those bridges and all of that stormwater infrastructure is downloaded on the municipality, HRM isn't prepared uh, to upgrade those in a reasonable fashion. Um, and so we're, we're struggling to keep up and to maintain infrastructure in that sense. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about what that, what that means, um, you know, as the mayor has, has, has pointed to, you know, wh when, when do we know to, to spend this money in this reserve fund and are there opportunities to, to be, be a little bit more proactive when it comes to ensuring that the municipality has funds to upgrade those roads? Um, I, I do know that, uh, you know, the capital money is much needed and I th want to thank Doug Butchett and the Glen Arbor Homeowners Association for presenting today because those capital funds are needed before we can actually put bodies in the fire station. 
And so while we look at the, uh, the ballot uh, item 13B for the million dollars, uh, I'm wondering if I can get a better understanding of, you know, is that, is that kind of a, a million dollars that's like spaghetti thrown at the wall? We think we can do it for that. Um, you know, uh, I realize that staff have been rushed to come forward with this uh, quote, but uh, you know, I am concerned uh, in the delay that we've seen with uh, Muscadabit Valley. Muscadabit Valley? Mus Muscadabit Valley, yeah. <laughs> so in getting that fire station uh, prepared to have 24-7 staff. So I'm just wondering if you can give me an understanding of is that million dollars actually going to be enough? And with the $1,048,200 that's sitting still on the bow for 13A, um, if, if we are able to move forward with the August uh, how uh, August training uh, recruitment, how um, positive or how confident is fire services that January uh, is going to be the start date? Because it feels like this is aspirational. Thank you. I'll answer the first part of your question and I will request fire to come down to speak to the uh, fire related component. With respect to HRM 01, um, you know, that agreement was done not too long after amalgamation uh, and around the same time uh, our first multi-year financial strategy was created and the original multi-year financial strategy that the municipality had contemplated the need for increasing capital from operating funding and that's how we should be funding the majority of our state of good repair for asset renewal. I believe at amalgamation, the amount of capital from operating funding was only around a million dollars and I believe we're up to around $57 million now. So we are growing our ability to fund asset renewal. Unfortunately, our assets increase every year. Every year. And when we are faced with challenging uh, budget years, often the, one of the easier targets for us to utilize to balance the budget instead of doing tax rate increases is to reduce capital from operating funding, yeah. as was the case this year. Yeah. Fire. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Through you to the committee members, Corey Beals, Deputy Fire Chief. And the figure that we provided, the $1 million, um, that is a best estimate based on the previous renovations that we've completed um, in prior stations, Station 28. Uh, that estimate came in at approximately a half a million dollars. Um, the quote that we received, Class A estimate for Station 38 is uh, just above $1 million. So when we look at those two figures, um, based on those basically being rural designs, um, we estimated that the renovation of Station 50 would be approximately a million dollars. Uh, we don't anticipate that that would be much higher than that. Um, taking into consideration that Station 38, there were some other items that we had to address at that station. It is an older building. Uh, we had to upgrade the entire electrical system in order to accommodate the installation of our um, commercial washer and dryers. And there were some other infrastructure issues that we had to address at Station 38 um, as it relates to structural engineering work. So the $1 million to renovate Station 50 is a best guess estimate. Um, obviously, we won't be able to give a more definitive um, um, amount um, to renovate that station until we go through the entire process um, as it relates to design consultant fees, and also to finalize exactly what the scope of that renovation project will look like. Okay. Thank you for your question, Councillor. Through the chair to you, Ken Stubing, the Fire Chief Executive Director for Halifax Regional Fire and Emergency. Uh, as outlined in our report, while we will be you know, pressed to try to get that amount of work done in uh, the amount of time that we have, and certainly some financial challenges, there is an opportunity to temporarily assign firefighters to the Upper Tintalan Station while that work is completed. It will not yield the benefits of what we would yield with Station 50 uh, if, you know, as far as response into the West Bedford Station for effective firefighting force as outlined in our urban response profile. 
Uh, and I think the other factor that, you know, council needs to understand that we took into consideration when deciding which station would best suit the needs. Uh, when West Bedford goes live, it is intended to be a composite station, career and volunteers, and half of the volunteers that would respond out of the new West Bedford station are actually currently responding out of station 50. So what that really means is the volunteer complement left in the station 50 area would be reduced almost in half. Mm -hmm. So some good news, bad news there. The good news is we would have experienced volunteer firefighters, including officers, to you know start up that new complement of firefighters in the West Bedford station. Uh, the bad news is we would be down to half of the volunteers in mm -hmm. Station 50's area. That's actually another benefit of that station being 24 hours yeah. because they would be able to work hand in hand 24 hours a day with the volunteers. We would, you know, recruit more firefighters to bring that up to full complement, but there would be, you know, a gap in experience. Yes, right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief and Deputy Chief and CAO. Moving on, uh, go ahead, Councillor Cuttle. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Nice to see you here. Um, a lot of work has been done here, and I want to just thank um, everybody that was involved in kind of really looking through the budget, looking for opportunities for cost savings, uh, looking for new approaches to things. Um, I, have, I have a couple of questions um, about that. Just when we, you know, looking at the debt, I mean, it, it is going up, and I do think that there is a time and place to use debt, um, but it's obviously not sustainable to continue to be growing our debt um, so drastically into future years, which is, which is really why, you know, we do need that new fiscal framework for municipalities and finding other opportunities for funding from the province and federal government to help us with our, with our infrastructure costs. I mean, that, that's something we've been advocating for. And, um, you know, when, I, I forget the term there, Councillor Lovelace used, but the, uh, you know, future surprises that might, be, that might be coming will hopefully help us manage that in the future because, you know, this idea that growth is paying for growth isn't really what we're experiencing, uh, particularly right now with that, with that big increase. Um, when we talk, when you talked about the deferring, the, like, the, we're having cost savings by deferring um, collecting taxes on projects that aren't going to be built this year. I'm just wondering, is that, like, what is the best practice around that? Why have we been doing that in previous years? I think it's been a question of council, like, you know, we're collecting this money, but the work isn't actually being done, and um, how much money have we collected for projects that, that haven't been built, and why are we continuing to collect money for new projects if we're not ready? I, what is the best practice around, around that? And while I, you, you, know, you did say that it's going to put further um, pressure on budgets uh, in subsequent years, um, like, is there a right way and a wrong way to do this? And I'm assuming the approach that you're bringing forward to us today has you know, some merit to it. So I'm just wondering if you can explain that a bit more. There, uh, through the chair to uh, the councillor, so there are a number of sources of best practice for municipal finance. The one we would look to the most would probably be the Government Financial Officers Association and also our um, requirements under um, the charter or um, provincial rules around um, municipal finance in terms of the amount of debt we can carry. Uh, with respect to our requirements, we do have debt service ratios that we have to live within. We also have ca various capital funding strategies that council has approved from time to time, such as the debt policy, such as reserve strategies, and uh, overarching you know, municipal finance strategies. We are operating in a way that 
I would say is well in line with best practice. We're not doing anything that is out of whack with uh, what other major cities are doing. We are a little bit different than other major cities though because we do not do our own municipal bond issues, for example, and we do all of our borrowing through the uh, provincial um, municipal finance corporation, which is now part of the Department of Finance. But we are well in line with what I would call normal practice. And I'm gonna see if the CFO would like to add to that answer. Thank you, uh, CAO, Jerry Blackwood, uh, Chief Financial Officer. Not, not a lot to add to that one, but I'll just take council back to what this council has approved, okay? So in terms of you approved a fiscal sustainability strategy, right? And that strategy centered around trying to build up uh, reserves uh, around uh, recapitalization and development of new uh, capital assets that would have a major impact on the tax rate, okay? Back in 20, I think it was a 20, uh, uh, 223 budget, council approved uh, a list of what we call uh, strategic initiative projects. So they would be the Forum, Cogswell, uh, Multimodal Quarters, IMP, Halifax, EV buses. That, that was a financial strategy where we implemented the climate action tax and then we implemented on the general rate an amount that would go into what we call SI, the Strategic Initiatives Reserve every year. So again, it was try to put away uh, tax upfront for funding that's gonna help mitigate debt servicing down the road. So one of the charts and the thing that we always tend to caution on, and it's something that the, you know, the next council will have to really deal with is those projects that I just listed are like a billion, billion dollars worth of projects. So, you know, um, some of those aren't cost shared. B, you know, BTC obviously uh, will be looking for a cost share in that, but you know, it's easy three, four hundred million dollars in, in municipal debt that we're gonna have to take out. So what we've been doing over the last few years is building up that strategic initiative reserve to try to mitimate, uh, mit mitigate, sorry, those, um, principal and interest payments that are gonna be coming in the next, uh, the next few years. Um, having said that, right, uh, to the CAO's point, uh, we've really taken a shift from um, capital, from operating funding for, de uh, for capital projects and a shift over to taking, taking uh, more debt. So when we talk about uh, this year, we're gonna really look at reserves, we're gonna look at funding strategies, and that'll be, you know, we'll bring that forward for the next council. Uh, it'll be looking at a better, maybe looking at how can we adjust, how have we done in the last term uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, trying to provide the, the net benefit to the taxpayer in terms of an overall tax increase, right? as those assets are developed and as they come online and then have to be, be operated. I'm sorry if that was a bit long-winded, but um, that's one of the strategies that we have in place right now that, that council approved a few years ago. Yeah, no, uh, my time is up, but uh, I'll be back. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Go ahead, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to staff for all the work on this. Um, I'm kind of actually, I'm in agreement with the mayor on this one, um, on the Central Library Fund. I mean, I think it's prudent to save for assets, but it seems odd to only save for one particular one that's so far out, um, especially when we're kind of struggling just on so many other day-to-days. Um, doesn't quite square with me, but uh, I gather that kind of question is something that you're going to look at more fulsomely in the reserve review process? Okay. Um, and that would come forward sometime this coming year? Yes. Okay, so there's nothing we need to do about that right now today unless we were to say, I mean, part of my inclination would be uh, with debt 
coming um, this year, we could take that 11 million and reduce the amount of debt we're going into, which then becomes money that, you know, we we have available next year. Is that something we considered? If we took the 11 million dollars now, it would reduce capital from operating funding. Um, we wouldn't be looking at reducing debt funding. Um, why, why not reduce the debt funding? Like, I'm, I, I don't think we should reduce the capital from operating either, because that's just, there's a hole to dig ourselves out of next year, and it's not going to help by digging it deeper this year, but why not reduce the, the debt financing piece that, that we have? Because I know you already went through that exercise of squeezing that as far as you could. We could apply it to projects to reduce The projects we're issuing debt funding for now or planned to issue debt funding f for now, like our principal and interest payments that are in this year's budget are, are for things that are going to be completed this year or have already been completed in previous years um, that were funded with debt. Okay. Um. Well, with it coming forward, I don't know that we necessarily need to make an on-the-fly, spur-of-the-moment decision today, but, I mean, it's, it does seem odd to me to be taking on new debt that's going to cost us more in interest and servicing when we have a fund that's there. Um, so let me try to explain this in a more clear way. <laughs> we could use the $11 million to fund projects in the 24-25 capital budget instead of planned issuance of debt, but that would not have a direct, you know, one-for-one one positive impact on the operating budget. I'm, I'm actually fine with that. I'm uh, engaging in the rare thing as a politician of what's this going to mean a few years ahead, not <laughs> not like uh, right now, um, because you know all this is stuff we have to pay for later. Thank you. I, don't think I, I think you know my answer now that I have an understanding of your question is the correct one. We could use the 11 million dollars. Um, as a funding source instead of debt for some of the capital projects. We wouldn't be able to say with certainty what impact that would have on the P&I payments for next year without doing a calculation. Okay. The other side of it is that, I mean, that money is going to be there also next year, so we could um, also revisit this question. There's <coughs> not a, I don't think there's a burning need to go spend that $11 million today. Um, so I'm, I'd also be fine with thinking about that in that broader context. Um, I did want to ask, um, and this is maybe a little bit procedural, um, to the chair or to our lawyer, how we go about dealing with the encampment piece, which is in camera, um, because I think that we should do that in public. Do I need to So we would motion? need to go, unless people are prepared to do it without discussion, but what is in camera is is confidential. Uh, so I disagree and would like to make a motion then, to do it in public. Then if there's any discussion on it, we need to go in camera and have a conversation about it. Otherwise, if you want to try the will of council, you could move to have it made public now without debate. Well, I, I will come back, colleagues. I, w I do want to, I think we do need to go in camera then to discuss that, um, but I don't want to derail our whole discussion by doing that now. So I will circle back on this um, in debate, but you know, I don't think we should be in camera for it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Huston. Thank you, uh, Chair. Just just on the question on the library reserve. So, what staff have recommended is is a as a, a contribution holiday for this year. Um, it, council can certainly you know um, use reserves to to you know reduce debt financing or to reduce other expen expenditures. I, I would say that's a one that's a one time. Um, money that we're just going to have to come back and it's going to uh, bump up a tax increase next year. And <clears throat> when we talk about looking at our reserves, one of the things I want to remind Council is, you know, we um, used up uh, pretty much all of our risk reserve to fund up all the, the fires, the floods and the storms. So 
um, you know, when we look holistically at reserves, we want to make sure that we can, uh, we're certainly positioned well for any uh, emergencies that uh, may uh, come up uh, next year and future years. Thank you. Thank you, CFO. Go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you. Um, I have a question for, my first question is for, actually for fire, and I wonder if the, the chief and the team can come, come down. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, Chief, good to see you. Uh, it's, the question was asked earlier by uh, Councillor Lovelace about, you know, is there enough money for the project that she asked about, you know, and the response was, to our best guess, uh, you know, around a million bucks is w until we look at it deeper. Uh, my question is about when we look at all the things that we've added to fire during these budget conversations for 24, 25, how realistic is to get all that done? I mean, new recruitment class, doing that up, standing it up in August, and the list goes on and on. I mean, here we are already uh, uh, into April. Uh, you know, what, what's what's the percentage of it actually getting it all done? Through the chair to you, Councillor, um, thank you for the question. Uh, the reality is, operationally, we can achieve that. So we are typically uh, an organization that can run two recruit classes for career firefighters a year. And as mentioned uh, during the budget presentations by our uh, president, he identified that we were not planning to run a class in August. Uh, largely because we didn't see a large influx of people wanting to retire. So we were leaving that class available for, you know, the possibility of retirees because we just, when we get retirees, we just fill the positions. We don't have to ask for permission to f fill those positions. So uh, we're already in preparation uh, for starting a class in August if this decision is made. Uh, so that would be 15 firefighters for the station and we would probably top that up to a class. We like to stay in groups of four, that's the way we do our training. So it'd be no less than 16 or 20 firefighters and those other one to you know five firefighters would be actually for retirees instead of waiting till August. So the reality is operationally, we can make that happen. And, and we've identified all the cost pressures to do that because we didn't do it in our pressure exercise right. because we weren't planning to do it. So that's why you see costs for people to be seconded from operations into the training division right. to run that class. So we are ready to go. We would have a class uh, ready to go in August if that's the decision of council. What does it look like, and thank you for that, Chief, and what does it look like, the conversation we had earlier here about Upper Town, uh, you know, if we're, we proceed as being what's recommended here, what does that look like by the end of the next fiscal year? Can you give me a picture of what that looks like? Uh, are, we, are we operating? Uh, is the capital work done? Uh, can, can, uh, I'm trying to picture what that looks like. Uh, thank you for another question. Uh, so to clarify that, so we had originally planned in the original budget to onboard new staff in February, train them because right. it takes four months to train right. them and have them go live in July, which would be the next fiscal year. So by moving them up six months, that triggers all kinds of other change. Right. We need the additional six months worth of wages, which is in the briefing note. Uh, the original OCA that had been presented to the CAO and approved also uh, included the next fiscal year onboarding uh, two district chiefs to turn uh, our district chief model to three 24-hour district chiefs instead of two because now we would have 24-hour stations spread all the way from the Tintalan area. I know we keep saying Tintalan, but you know, Station 50 area all the way to Sheed Harbor. And it's just not reasonable to think two people can manage that 
geography, not to mention the span of control for number of firefighters. Uh, and it also included the wage differentials. When the recruits uh, go operational, we will need to promote engineers and captains. So all of that pressure was added to the budget. So, you know, we can operationally achieve the conversion. The only complication would be the station, but we already identified we could temporarily work out of the Tintalan station because that was built for a 24 hour model, but it operationally does not achieve any of the benefits that 50 does. So we would absolutely only do that temporarily. Okay, uh, thank you for that chief. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll come back. Great, thank you, Councillor Mancini. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Chair, and likewise, great to, as I wrote, has been saying, great to see you back. Uh, long may you reign. <laughs> uh, the, uh, you know, tax is 6.2% uh, tax increase. Uh, the thing I said to Councillor Mancini when we were going through the slides very quickly there is no one in the media is going to report on the fact that it's a 0 0.007 cent increase on the rate, right? And I'm jealous all the time, I think I've said to ch the chamber before, uh, of my uh, uh, cousin-in-law, uh, Angela, who's uh, uh, Angel, who's a councillor in uh, Cumberland, and they lead on their press release just with the tax rate. And every year it's like, we held the tax rate, aren't we great? And you know, assessments are going like this. Uh, we will not get away with that here, but, but it is good to note uh, that 6.2 is smack between uh, what StatsCan reports is uh, wage growth, average wage growth and inflation, one being inflation being about 4.6 and uh, wage growth being about 8.6. It's interesting to me that we haven't yet had a debate, and I don't think we are this year, but I think this is something we're really gonna have to look to based on what we've heard from the CAO and talk about how we are going to uh, insulate low income and vulnerable people, specifically targeted rather than just trying to look at the tax rate because we have these pressures that are coming that, that we're all talking about, uh, but we haven't talked about uh, how can we expand the low income bus pass program or what are we, is the, uh, uh, tax relief for low-income homeowners adequate and what those kind of things, which I think we're going to have to really increase our focus on in the next uh, uh, coming four years. Um, I'm okay with streetscapes because I know they're very, very busy this year. I'm okay with police fleet if it doesn't affect reliability, so I'm going to look to the CAO and, and the police to talk about that. I'm, I'm a little worried because I hear anecdotally that there are issues with reliability with uh, that fleet, so I'd like some comment on that. I'm okay with a pause on the library OCC. Uh, you know, I, I came in after the library business case was built. That all happened in 2010-11, so, so I can't take any ownership of that. But I do know that it's probably, uh, you know, we're 20 years away from potentially having to spend $25 min million dollars replacing or upgrading the windows, so we need to be cognizant of that. But I did say to the CAO when we discussed this, changing the library uh, reserve to a library capital reserve might help, because I will say to this council, and I will challenge you all, um, I've had three full-time CEOs and three acting CEOs in the time I've been here, and you know what the first thing that comes in that's proposed to be cut every time? Well, let's push out that library a little longer. Second is recreation. I want Maggie to hear that too, that I, I recognize that. So, so those are the things that always get pushed out, and everybody here is libraries and want expanded or renovated, so I think we need to really think about that because having some guaranteed funding would allow some certainty in planning. Uh, Going to the actual uh, numbers and stuff, I'm in the same headspace as Councillor Austin. I have those minor questions about today, but my, my questions are, or my concern is, what do we do in the future? Because we had the CAO say, at 6.2% this year, it's 6 to 7% next year, the, except that is that with or without the delays in expenses that we are being asked to approve, or is that going to push it up at that further percent you mentioned to seven to eight percent? And then we're hearing that in out years, uh, you know, starting in about two years, we're looking at a two percent being added to inflationary costs to cover debt servicing that we're approving right now. So that means. And I apologize to you, Councillor Cleary, because I was very dismissive in our text chat about this earlier this week, and now I'm like, oh yeah, that's really bad. That's, we're looking at five, six, seven, eight percent every year for the next four years. That's how it reads to me, which means that Council, 
mostly it'll be next council, but the setup for this is all this summer leading into an election, which is the worst possible time. We need to be talking about looking at our structural costs and most of our cost drivers aren't capital. It's not moving stuff to debt or delaying a project. It's staffing. It's how many police and firefighters we have. It's how many people we have. And I'm not saying we should go and do a deep cut, but we can't keep adding those except for the new services that we've identified, maybe. Like if you want BRT, Fast Ferry is gonna be 60, 70, 80 staff, right? Like that's gonna increase full-time costs. But we really have to look at how we can slow down, try and match our wage growth, the wage envelope, uh, which is both the, what they're getting in settlements, right? But they're getting it through collective uh, agreements and, and the number of FTEs are adding. Because if we don't come to grips with that and get that down to a reasonable number that reflects a reasonable growth in taxes, we'll be back here every year for the next 10 years. I know I did a good job because the CFO is looking at me like, finally, somebody's saying that. So you're welcome, Jerry. But uh, so I have those questions to leave for the CAO. And, and generally, I think we did a good job for this year. I am really worried about the next four years. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through the chair to the councillor, the uh, police fleet question. I am comfortable with the recommended reduction there because we're still putting the order in for the vehicles. It's just a reflection that those vehicles are not going to arrive this year. They will arrive early in the next fiscal year. So it shifts um, some uh, burden to next year. Uh, with respect to libraries, uh, the idea of a library replacement reserve versus just a you know, central library replacement reserve is certainly one we'll consider through the reserve strategy. I will say that uh, we have recognized the value of libraries and made several positive changes this year for the library's budget, including uh, uh, finding a resolution to the longstanding issue of the way that collections and replacement of the collection is enhanced and funded. So council approved that in December and this new budget reflects it. Um, with respect to your concerns about the um, structural deficit we're really building into the municipal budgets, I think this is an issue that's been identified by finance staff for the last several years, and I think the solution is probably, you know, the three-part approach of looking at what are our core municipal services we deliver and how are they staffed? The second piece is continuing to focus on a modernized fiscal arrangement that uh, befits the, you know, a city of our size. And the third thing is looking at the revised funding strategy, taking into account, you know, our future capital requirements as we are, you know, one of the fastest growing municipalities in the country. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Thank you, CAO. Let's go to uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so two, two quick questions and really quickly just a comment to echo what other colleagues have mentioned about pushing the difficulties financially down the road and, and also to give credit to Jerry, you've told us this for a little while uh, and, and we're seeing it and we, we saw it last budget and we're seeing it today and we're gonna continue to see that we don't kind of change the strategy of how we're dealing with uh, debt and funding. So two questions I have, one is related to the streetscaping. I wonder if you can, I'm not sure who, who could maybe Brad, I'm not sure, uh, could just unpack that, because I know that our, our bids, uh, business improvement districts, were looking forward to that, but I understand if we can't deliver, we can't deliver, so I'm wondering if that could just be unpacked a little bit more. Oh, sorry, my phone's ringing. Um, and uh, the, the other one is just related, related to uh, one of the, should we save items for BAL later, or should, or should we do that now? I'm just wondering what, now or later is okay. Good. I'll do. I'll do it now. Just so. So the only one I have a question on, and I'm pretty much fine with it. It's it's the facilities budget, extra duty policing for Albany 19 BN002. So when, when we approved this, the direction was that we would approve for facilities, understanding that Albany would be um, highlighted because of the issues facing. But we changed it that if there's other facilities that you know after analysis recognize that they do need it, that that funding could also support them. Uh, so I'm just wondering if, if 
if that is still reflective to what we approved that the budget process. And I only say that because, you know, I have one shelter f temporarily has a 24 hour shelter uh, or one facility that has 24 hour shelter and they're dealing with issues. Um, but at the same time, I'd be more than happy if Albany gets 100% of this money. I just want to make sure that we have the opportunity to ha if other facilities after analysis need to access this, that they can, they can request that funding. And that's it. Okay. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the councilor. Um, in terms of the streetscaping and tactical urbanism uh, budget deferrals, and streetscaping is related to Bruns, well, first of all, both of them have decent carry forward amounts. Second of all, uh, in terms of streetscaping, that money, a uh, big chunk of that, 400,000, was dedicated towards Brunswick. Brunswick, as I had mentioned earlier, as a result of the major detour pattern we expect on Cogswell, we're deferring Brunswick to next year, not to create complete challenges in the core. And then in terms of streetscaping, streetscaping money was dedicated towards lower water and we're not ready to go on that. There's more design work to be done in advance, so they're just carrying forward to next year when they'll actually be uh, you know, executed and funds right. out the door. Good, no, that, that's very helpful. respect to the question regarding the uh, extra duty policing, uh, th that was budgeted solely based on Alderney Landing. However, if additional security concerns regarding other HRM facilities arise through the year, we'll try to accommodate it as best we can. Just to clarify, we, we, we changed the but the, the motion at that meeting to recognize facilities, not just Alderney. So I, again, I'm fine if it goes to Alderney because I understand there's issues there. I just want to make sure that we're following direction that if other facilities recognize they have concerns and need it, then they can access the money, that's all. John McPherson, Executive Director of Property, Fleet and Environment. Uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the Councillor. Uh, the budget was uh, put together based on Alderney, but the way the, uh, the adjustment is written and the, uh, the write-up is written, it's applicable to any HRM facility. So it'll be able to, use, to be used um, for any HRM facility. Okay, okay, great, that's helpful. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Smith, and thank you, staff. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Outfit. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome home. It's good to see you. Um, so I just wanted to clarify a few things. We're talking 6.2%, but that's with the roughly 2% bluebird, if you will, that we've received from the province. And that's correct? I'm seeing nodding heads. So we should pat ourselves on the back a little, but not too much, because we did get a 2% uh, bluebird from the, uh, the province when it comes to us collecting money for corrections and housing. I still agree with, uh, and I certainly agree with the uh, way that we need to uh, come up with some more targeted, what I call tax relief. I think that's overdue and, and very good uh, judgment. It makes me a little sad when I hear some of the comments today, well, we're gonna have to do this, and at some point we're gonna have to do that, about staffing and about capital and whatnot, because I, I think, in a way, we're being a little unfair to the incoming council who's gonna have a new mayor and probably 30 to 50% new councillors who are probably not gonna have the first clue what they're doing initially. But uh, it is what it is, although I have to say that it, uh, it bothers me a little and I have to take some of the blame for that because I've been here for the last number of budgets and number of years. So I hope, uh, I hope they will forgive us. Um, I, I'm gonna do my regular, the Bedford Library, promised since 1996. Um, delayed for things and with my approval, my support for things such as renovations to the Kesham Goodman, of course in the building of the, the Central Library, which initially folks, people thought we had lost our minds until they actually saw that built and went in and used it. They actually thought we'd lost our minds and I'm so glad we did it. I like the idea of a library reserve in general because I think we're gonna be looking for $14 million to make sure that the ferry terminal on the Bedford waterfront has a library with it. So if we used a little bit of this reserve or some of this reserve for the central library, 
to give back to the people who supported the Central Library and the Keshem Goodman and the Dartmouth and the Woodlawn and everything else over those 30 years, it mightn't be a bad idea. Does that require a motion or are we gonna wait and see what we do with reserves, Madam CAO? We recommend that you wait until you see okay. the reserve strategy come back. And that will come to this existing council? I'm looking at the CFO to see if that will come I to this I think that would be very council. unfair to do to a new council. Thank you, uh, uh, CAO. So um, what our plan is, is ne well, I mean, next year, uh, we'll be looking probably the first touch point with the new council from a financial perspective will be uh, around uh, around budget. So, you know, our plan was to bring forward a new financial strategy and a fiscal strategy for the new council. I would be happier if this council on its way out the door took another look at uh, reserves and uh, and the capital projects list. I think that would be fair to our successors. I don't know how we others feel about that. We'll see what happens. Um, the other question I have, and this touches on fire stations, which of course, and I'm so grateful for what we're doing in West Bedford for a composite station to serve the, uh, the town that we've built there over the last number of years and surrounding areas. But I'd like to ask the chief, are we going to go back into a little bit of a station location rethink again? Because I don't think the problem has changed during your time here that we still have a bunch of stations that previous chiefs thought were too small, didn't handle the right type of equipment, the right type of equipment couldn't get in and out of them, were not in the areas where we've experienced growth. So I just want to make sure we're not doing well. Let's put one here and let's expand this one here when we still need to have this great big overview of where we have to have more perhaps mega stations or more centralized stations. So I'd just like to see your thoughts on that as we talk about fire stations, and thank you. Thank you for your question, Councillor, through the chair. Um, over this next year, one of our strategic priorities is to work with the contractor that we have yes. uh, with Black Horse, which helped us with our analysis and confirmed our beliefs uh, in our response capabilities. And, the con and we also are onboarding a new position, actually a couple positions to deal with this analysis and work with our partners. So our partners would uh, be the planning and development team, uh, the public works team, and there's a lot of integration on our response capability with the road network, not only our staffing and the stations and the apparatus, but the locations of those stations and, and the street network and community growth plans. So the plan over this next year is to, you know, work closer with our partners, use the tools that we now have uh, learned to use well, and to do that analysis and find out if there's a more effective and efficient response capability that we have missed, but also uh, address growth pressures and try to be more proactive and strategic in investments. And that's not to say we haven't been doing that. No. We've been coming to council using data kind of one step at a time, but we want a longer horizon to manage uh, our needs in relation to community growth and community risk. All right. Well, thank you. I find that very encouraging. Thank you, Chair. But I would like us to have a, a, this council before we depart another look at capital projects and, uh, and reserves before we leave. Thank you. Personally, I would tend to agree with that. Thank you very much, Councillor Outlet. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I echo my colleagues, nice to see you up there. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kathy. Um, what a lot of work. Um, and I do appreciate um, seeing all of those reductions of the 8.8 .8 million, um, some conversations that we had, I see reflected in that, which is great. Um, I think what's worrying me the most is a little bit of this, getting 6.2 down if we can, but looking at the future years, um, some of the things that are on that foul list, when you look at the next two years, 
they go from 250,000 to 900,000 to the numbers are really big. Um, and, and the other thing is, I feel like we need to get back to being right-sided a little bit. We've got the province doing planning and us doing community services. Um, yeah. It's a little bit scary in that way. Um, and when we look at the investment that we make in homelessness as a result of you know years of the province not looking at housing and what happens, but how do we get back to the municipality is responsible for this, the province is responsible for this, and we get that clearer. And I think in your comments when you said there are some bright spots uh, yet to be determined, but maybe some of that is getting more clear clarity on our municipal service agreement and where that's going to be, I hope that we do see that, but it's a little scary. Um, and just about fire, um, one of the interesting things when, um, Chief, you said that operationally Station 50 can get done. Well, last year in the budget, Station 38, we approved it to go to 24 seven and with a number of firefighters. Um, they're not there yet and it's April of a new year. And the tender for the work that needs to be done on that only went out last month. So realistically, how is it gonna get done in station 50 in a year if what you've seen in station 38 hasn't happened? And I know that there were probably things that came along and maybe a few surprises, but again, there might be more surprises at station 50. So I, I'm, I guess I have less confidence that that might get done in a year, but just from the experience we've had in station 38 and we still don't have that station running. Uh, although in the last I guess two months ago maybe, there was a change made for shifting, uh, some shift changes or something in 38. Um, so until we see something else, um, and I, you know, when I, I look at the Just Food Action Program, that's one of the ones where I'm thinking, you know, what's our lane and what's not? And when I look at the Just Food Program, it is a fantastic program. It is well structured, but my really question is, is that our, is that for us to do? So I still don't know where I fit with that, but I'm gonna look forward to hearing some of the more conversation from my colleagues. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Daigle Gammon. Uh, Councillor Purdy, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and also great to see you up there in the chair again. Um, so, Thank you, uh, CAO, staff, Jerry. I mean, I, yeah, I can't imagine somebody said <laughs> those midnight, working, burning the midnight hours to, to get this um, to this point. So thank you very much. Um, I, I echo some of the comments made today, especially what is our lane? Um, doing a lot of community services with our taxpayer and money is not what the municipality is meant to do. We're, you know, streets, garbage, sidewalks, policing, fire, so, of course, libraries, parks and rec. <laughs> Not a fan of the IMP, but anyway. Um, yeah, we, like our, our roads are the, we need, we need our roads to be improved, um, all those potholes fixed, and that's what our residents want to see, us doing what we are supposed to be doing. Um, I, I guess I've got a lot of comments and questions, but I, I guess I'll start with transit. And I mean, it is so complicated and complex and with our huge municipality and all of the competing needs, uh, I, I can't even imagine trying to figure out how to um, solve all the transit problems. And really looking forward to the new plan, the new long-term plan, how that's going to address some of the existing issues that we're seeing. I am not in favor of increasing um, transit fares, and I'm not in favor of increasing the tax to cover the transit fare increase that I, I apparently is needed um, at all. If we increase the fare, we're punishing the people for using transit and we're punishing the very people who are the working, middle, lower classes. Uh, they, they are not getting a break anywhere uh, financially. So no, I will not support that. Um, and if we, 
transfer it over to the, the tax rate, well, like the CAO said, we're basically making everyone who d doesn't use transit pay for the, um, the shortage. And we need to increase ridership. Transit just found out in Transportation Standing Committee last week that we're only up to a 85% pre-COVID level. Even though the numbers, the stats look like we are back to those original levels, but we're not actually. So how can we get back up there and how can we exceed pre-COVID? transit ridership, that's where we can recover some money. Uh, we need to increase our service reliability and solve our overcrowding issues. So I know that transit is doing hard work on, on both of those things. So I'm hoping we'll see some big uh, revenue improvements with those, those things improved. It's kind of like they, they would go together. And if not, then I would like to propose we use some of that central library reserve to help cover the cost and not see an increase in taxes or a fair increase uh, for our residents at this time. And um, I think I'll just leave it there for now. Um, if I wanted to put that out there, that would be a motion, correct? That would be an, a motion to amend the main a motion. A motion to amend. So I'll just wait and I'll come back to do that. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Go ahead, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, all right, uh, I feel like we're just digging into the bell here. Uh, thanks everyone for your comments. Um, Deputy Mayor, I have similar concerns over the, the Just Food program. Um, you know, in particular about making sure that the money is, is going to where it's needed most. You know, um, while we have, uh, you know, while there's, a, you know, a fairly modest amount in this year's budget, um, we know that next year we're going to be looking at about $900,000 and, and continuing. And it's unclear at this point through that strategy how that money is going to specifically be used. I know a lot of it is going to external agencies to hire people to get programs off the ground. Um, but, you know, in terms of, of how we, you know, how we, we manage that and, you know, and ensure impact, I, I have concerns. Also, we've just, just, just been announced both at the federal level and the provincial level that they're looking at doing uh, school, national school food programs for lunches. That was one of the items that was in the Just Food Action Plan that, th that they were looking at. Um, and, it, and also about kind of, you know, s you know, staying in our lane. It's a hundred, you know, it's great. It, it, we do need a food strategy, um, but is that, is that the strategy? And in, in speaking to some uh, service providers in Spryfield, um, many have said they weren't consulted in this. You know, when they, when they look at this and they see more studies, they see, you know, more surveys, more mapping, more, um, you know, communication, they're like, how much more, like, how many more meetings do we have to go to where we share our knowledge, but we don't actually get anything in, in return for that. What they're struggling with is keeping their doors open. And there's a big discrepancy between groups that own their buildings versus groups that rent their buildings and how the municipality supports them. And I don't see any of that in this strategy. Um, I wish there were some alternatives uh, in the staff report that, you know, it's either all or nothing here rather than having some options about, um, you know, what, what initiatives could we move forward and what would we need to move forward on some of those initiatives, if not the whole thing. Um, but I, I do have concerns. Uh, but with that, there is something else that I would like to put on the floor here uh, to a motion about removing item four from the bell. Um, I want to move that the budget committee amend the main motion to remove bell 04 from the 24-25 proposed operating budget in order to fully fund parks and rec staffing. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Um, so this gets to the point about what are some of our core services. And what's being proposed here as a cost service is only to you know, fund 50% of um, positions for Parks and Rec, which will have, um, well, for a few items for Parks and Rec, it's on uh, page 22. You can look at the list here. But what it will impact if we don't fully, if we don't fully fund these positions, um, 
we will have a delay in, um, in trail work. And I don't know about your, your districts, but in my districts, my trails are incredibly overgrown. I've been talking with, uh, with Brad and Public Works about how we can address those issues and actually, you know, hoping we could add more resources. Um, what we're proposing here is actually less resources. Those, those trails and those connectors, they need to be prioritized, but they're essential for people to walk safely around our communities, to, you know, be active, to access our parks, um, to control uh, evasive species. Um, we need more trail maintenance, and so this, this reduction is a, is a concern to me. Um, the reduction will also, um, you know, uh, mean that we don't get additional litter cans or um, litter pickup routes. We know that litter is a huge problem in many of our parks, um, so that's a concern. Um, grooming and lining fields. There was a 7,000 hour increase in bookings last year on our fields, and we're looking at cutting the ability to maintain those fields and to groom and line them properly, which means that there's just gonna be additional pressure on our existing recreational resources, which um, when we know we have increasing demand. Um, and again, I think this is somewhere we need more investment, not, not a reduction. And, um, and the other area of impact will be on our community sport agreements and partnerships. You know, we've just come up with a new um, field playing strategy, playing field strategy. Uh, we're looking at how we work with our stakeholder groups better to ensure that we have a broader range of recreational opportunities in our communities. And um, so, you know, further reducing this is, um, is an issue as well as things like uh, cutting the grass. I think, uh, I don't know um, if there's any stats on that, but you know, already we're looking at longer growing seasons. I know it was an issue last year. I assume it's gonna be an issue going forward. We actually need, again, we need more maintenance, not less, to ensure that our fields are in working order to be able to support and meet the increased demand. So uh, with that, uh, I look forward to any further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. On the amendment, go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I see the folks from Parks and Rec are here. I wonder if they could step forward. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, good to see you both, uh, Maggie and, and Ray. Uh, so I wonder, just to follow up on Councillor Cuddle's uh, she's asking to not cut the Parks and Recs positions, which is $388,900, but she's saying if we do cut that, and I just want to confirm what she's telling me is accurate, if we do cut that, does that mean less trail maintenance, less trash cans, less maintenance of fields, uh, impact the field strategy, grass not being cut? Is that the direct impact of not uh, putting that forward? Uh, Maggie McDonald, Executive Director for Parks and Recreation. Uh, my apologies, the bunny brought me a cold as well as uh, candy. Um, <clears throat> but uh, just to, so to clarify the, the increase, this is a reduction in the increase that was right. proposed. So there's still an increase associated with um, status quo in, in, the, in the recommendation. Uh, I would say, however, it's largely to maintain or, or come back to status quo levels of service. Um, because of the increases, as, as Councillor Cuddle has mentioned, in terms of field booking hours, um, increasing use of parks, and so on and so forth. So I'll ask Ray to just uh, comment a little further on the on the uh, overall impacts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, yes, just uh, building on what Maggie just uh, alluded to there, um, we do have a, a large number of work orders for trail vegetation cutback and removal. Um, we, we're just... Uh, falling behind and um, as, as the parks get busier and uh, our work orders continue to build, um, we're gonna need the additional staff to be able to support that. Um, and in terms of grass, um, we have uh, two uh, contract supervisor positions that monitor those contracts. And uh, um, you know, basically uh, what's happened is we've had the same number of staff, <coughs> excuse me, um, for those 
uh, to monitor the grass um, for about the last eight to 10 years and the grass contracts are increasing. So every year we add about <clears throat> 20 to 30,000 square meters of grass um, and the two positions have been monitoring that for this whole time. So one of the increases to, uh, to, to, to staffing is an additional contract supervisor to monitor grass contracts and uh, shrub bed contracts as well. So, so I'm not sure if it answers my question though, Ray, if, if the, you don't get this increase in funding, uh, are we saying that the trash cans aren't getting replaced, the fields aren't getting taken care of, and the grass is not getting cut? Or are you just saying that it's just uh, business as usual as the past uh, number of years, uh, it all still gets done, but it, it's a stress uh, on resources? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that, that's correct. We continue to, to work um, to, um, to try to uh, maintain that service, but we're falling behind, basically, and we need to catch up. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Mancini. Go ahead, Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just a couple more questions for Parks. Um, could some of this expense be shared with uh, active, trans active transportation? Because um, the reason I'm asking is we ha I have some beautiful parks and trails in District 12 and the trails need a lot more work that's not being done, not to, the, not to reflect on the work of Parks and Rec. Um, but I think it's in conjunction with um, active transportation because it is a way, it is, sorry about that. It is a way to, um, effectively exercise and get some fresh air and everything that the residents need at the current time and in the future. Thank you. Through you, Chair, to the Council, the, the amounts identified in this piece speak to the, the parks components of trails, so not the active transportation trails, but rather those trails that um, go through parks. Um, we can certainly take it away and, and talk to our colleagues on inactive transportation. There would be some instances where there'd be sort of adjacent pieces that would be, um, that, that may be affected uh, by this, but, uh, but broadly speaking, this is about um, parks that are maintained by, or trails that are maintained by parks. Okay, so there's, okay, so active transportation, I would assume, has their own budget? I'm sorry. Nope, <laughs> that's correct. Okay, <clears throat> great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Stoddard. Go ahead, Councillor Altet. Me being me, I want to get down into the weeds of this cutting a little bit, okay? So there we go, moan, groan, all right. Um, so one of the most common complaints that I've had over the last few years, and I have to admit that uh, Tom and Cons and others have been great at trying to address them, right, is that First of all, we only have the two supervisors, but quite often one of them's off. It's not unusual for staff to want a summer vacation. So we're actually, many parts of the summer, we're down to one supervisor, and of course, Tom may know this area better than Cons, and Cons may know this area better than et cetera, et cetera. So I find myself quite often, and, and other councillors probably do this and, and teams do this, so we're out there saying, okay, well, this one hasn't been done, this one hasn't been done, this doesn't look like it's been done in a while. Uh, then we tried the idea of getting the teams to do some extra cutting themselves and prep work. So one little bit of an update on that because I think it was successful in some areas and, and not so successful in others. And then we all start getting the pictures about how you know, everything's beautiful in Hans County and Lunenburg and whatnot, and ours are terrible, and here are the pictures and whatnot. So I, I, my bigger concern, I guess, is though I do think we probably need another supervisor, but I'd like to understand a little bit more if we approve this increase, either partial increase or the complete increase, is are we really going to have the crews? Because what we, you know, labor costs have gone up, gas costs have gone up. We've had people actually walking away from grass cutting. I believe, because they're losing money. Well, most small businesses can't afford to lose money, so I understand that. So what I need to understand, if what we need to do, or have we done it, to try and get these things, at not just the paths, but the actual playgrounds and parks and the playing fields uh, mowed, uh, 
sooner. Last year was so wet, of course, it caused its problems as well. But I don't think the last couple of years have gone all that well when it comes to the playing field. So tell me what's going to be different and what we need to do to make it different, I guess is my question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, both, uh, all, all contracts now are um, uh, abide by the same social procurement policy. So the last year or two, we've had an imbalance in that, um, leaving half of, about half of the contracts, uh, contractors struggling to try to find people to mow. Um, that's been resolved now, and the new contracts are going out. Uh, actually, they've, they've gone out, um, so that'll help. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, taking some of our mowing back in-house, we, we are making a few strides with that slowly. Um, one of the uh, places, uh, some of the criteria that we look at to do that would be areas where um, we have a, a bundle of uh, ball divers or sport fields together um, to, to make it, uh, you know, give us as much chance of success as possible by bringing some of that back in-house. Um, so we're looking forward to this year. Um, we, we've implemented these changes and we think that, uh, that they'll be um, sufficient to start to make a, a move to, to see an improvement in that area. Okay, so I'm still struggling, I guess, perhaps like, like Tony was, so I, the extra 300,000, if it does or doesn't happen, do we still see a third person? Do we still see the crews? I guess, and, and I guess I'm asking, and I maybe I'm not trying to be hurt on you, Ray. It's just I'm trying to understand what the difference is with or without the 300k. Ray or, or Maggie, yeah. I can pick on Maggie uh, for a So chance. through you, through chair to the to the councillor. So we would de defer the hiring of the contract supervisor. That would okay. be one of the the um, changes that we would make if uh, the reduction went, or sorry, the you know. Okay. The, the net reduction, I guess, right. was, was lower, or the, the net increase was lower, I should say. Uh, so the, the contract supervisor would be reduced. We would um, reduce the number of sports field technicians that we would hire, but we would still hire more than we okay. had last right, year. So there's, um, you know, it's right. sort of we've made a, a recommendation based on if council wants to have right. a smaller increase, we would. Uh, have okay. some of the positions deferred and some of them right. hired. At so in my opinion, we need more people cutting. In my opinion, having one person on half the summer, because there's usually one off, is not sufficient. So I think I will be supporting what Councillor Cuddle is bringing forward. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Altick. Go ahead, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I won't be supporting the amendment. And you know, I, I think I thank you for uh, moving forward with uh, recommended reductions. We saw Public Works do that. Solid Waste did that. Um, certainly, I think that uh, the the plan that you have is sufficient. What I would like to see is parks uh, engage in much more process improvements better scheduling, uh, better communication, to, to be actually to operationalize that uh, efficiency throughout the entire um, a service. I know that Parks has done an incredible job catching up on inventory and actually creating an inventory control uh, mechanism so that you're, you know, doing a better job. But I think that there's, and I think you'd agree, Maggie, there's a lot more improvements available. So I'm not going to be supporting um, the amendment. I think that what Parks has proposed is sufficient. And uh, thanks for coming forward with uh, reductions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lovelace. There are no further speakers on the list. Are we ready for the question? I think, over to you, Ian. And that motion passes. Thank you very much. We are back on the main motion. Before we proceed, the mirror punched in uh, a couple of times and that sent the numbering off a little bit. So Mr. Mayor, go ahead. 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think my comments are more general. I think we're going to be getting into um, uh, item by item, so I'll, I'll try to come back later. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Morris, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my comments are about just food, and I see Leticia's here, so I wonder if she might come up, because I have a question. But first, I just wanted to comment on how happy I was to see the Just Food Plan and, and what a difference, um, if this is funded, uh, what a difference it would be in my community. Um, I have, part of my district is very high needs. It's like uh, Dartmouth North, but without the North Grove. And uh, we have one food bank. Um, it supports about 300 families a month, and they don't have a lot of other options. Um, and this, this food bank is, is not, you might imagine, uh, you know, a lot of canned goods and that sort of thing. No, this, this is a food bank where the volunteers go out and get fresh produce, they have eggs, they have frozen meat, they have a really strong focus on healthy food and delivering that. Um, it's run by volunteers, they put in at least two days a week. Um, to, to organize this. Um, they have to limit the number of times people can come into the food bank, otherwise they could not in any way meet the demand that has gone up quite a bit over two years. Um, you may remember this group won a volunteer group of the year award from HRM last, last year. Um, the volunteers, uh, a lot of them are in their 70s and 80s, and they've been running this food bank for about 30 years. So when I think about the Just Food plan, I think about these volunteers in my community, the commitment they have to delivering food to families. Um, they don't, they're putting two days a week into organizing this and they don't have a lot of other resources to do things differently to figure out how they might expand. And so my understanding is the Just Food plan would help leverage the work of all these volunteers across HRM in similar organizations um, so I'd just like Leticia to explain a little bit about um, what Just Food, the Just Food Plan could do if it was fully funded for groups like this in my community. Chair to the councillor. Uh, I would say that this fits in the world of community development and building community resilience similar to Halifax. Uh, you know, the work that's been happening with the public safety plan, uh, with the work investment that we make in libraries. So in addition to what I've spoken about before, about investing in, you know, municipal-led uh, initiatives that really help us to factor a basic need of food into municipal decisions, into emergency planning, et cetera, it's also about creating a space and investing in the people power needed to be able to coordinate community-based action so we can bring people together to share resources, to make sure that we you know, reduce redundancies, that we learn more about each other so that we can have grown in HRM solutions to the issues that are facing our community. So it is really about creating space and you know, using community wisdom and experiences to help us better understand where the vulnerabilities exist, but also where the capacity exists and, and where the strengths are that we can leverage for targeted action and investment. And could you say something about what, what difference you've seen in the ability of the groups to respond over the last two years? I'm hearing that um, these, the food banks and other groups that are delivering food are, are quite overwhelmed with the increase in demand from the last two years, and they feel um, you know, it's very hard to get ahead of what they're seeing out there. Yes, we're hearing across the board, and I'm sure you are as well, that, that these organizations are operating in crisis mode. The demand that they're seeing for food, the demand that they're seeing for help is unprecedented. They really struggled to deal with COVID and all the switches and change that happened to our food system through that. And it hasn't let up, it hasn't relented since then. And it's a very difficult place in which to come up with innovative solutions that are about changing the way that we do things so we are less vulnerable. So you really can't look at how do we increase our resilience if you don't have time and space to look at doing things differently. So that is really about what the Food Council is about and about pulling together this coordinating body is creating some space and some uh, resources to help us look at how do we do things differently and how do we better address the needs creatively and effectively. Thank you, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Morse. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Lovelace. 
Still in the main motion, right? We are on the main okay. motion. Excellent. Uh, so that's good. Just wanted to address, um, you know, this is a really good conversation. There's a lot, there's a lot going on. Um, in this budget, uh, certainly lots of moving parts. Um, it's the highest uh, prop average property tax increase I think that we've seen, probably since amalgamation, but that's just a guess. Uh, what I will say is that, um, you know, I think Councillor Mason asked the question, what do we, what do we do in the future? And, you know, that's, that's the million dollar question at this point, what do we do? You know, for decades, uh, Regional Council has kept the tax rate as low as possible, um, hasn't, uh, you know, funded uh, rural fire service or suburban fire service efficiently, underfunded uh, uh, suburban uh, transit, has underfunded complete communities in general. Uh, and certainly in looking at ways to address egress as a priority in communities that are in a high risk wildfire, um, underfunded. I mean, we can, we can go on. There's a long list of priorities that haven't been addressed. And I think it's fair to say that the first probably 10, 15 years, this municipality has struggled just to come together as far as having four different uh, municipalities merge. But at the same time, we have to address the needs today and plan for the future and have a vision for that. And looking at ways, I, th I think it was Councillor Daigle Gamma that said, how do we right size this, right? Like what is this new normal as far as stay in our lane or not stay in our lane? We just heard uh, Leticia answer a question about um, social services and, and food, funding food. We've got federal government just announced a national food pro program. We've got some changes that are happening there. So what is the role of a municipality in, in addressing some of those provincial and federal responsibilities? Yes, they're gaps, but does that mean that uh, the property taxpayer is responsible to fill those gaps when we know that the money's being collected from income taxes and from sales taxes? So, you know, I do think that it's important uh, to continue to have that, that ask that question. What is the new normal? What are we spending on? What are the priorities? And so I'm happy to see um, a fire station 24-7 uh, for Hammonds Plains West Bedford because keep in mind, we have well over 12,000 new units coming to this area when we already have the, the, a, a town the size of Truro in West Bedford. So between Lucasville, Hammonds Plains and West Bedford, all of the provincial planning areas, and there's four of them, um, there's pretty significant growth in this area. So not only thinking about fire and emergency services, but we're gonna have to address policing as well. So I'm pleased that we are addressing the most important issues in this budget. And how am I already out of time, Mr. Chair? <laughs> okay. Three minutes. Thank you. Second. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Go ahead, Councillor Mason. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, you know, it's been a bit of a miraculous budget season where uh, the part that has blown me away the most is how uh, after years of disagreeing with most of what the Chamber of Commerce brought forward, suddenly we're converging in the same spot. Uh, I find that their, uh, their approach uh, was relieving to, to be uh, accepting that there is inflation, for example, is great. And, uh, you know, the 4.6% they uh, proposed was not possible, but was certainly higher than we'd seen in the past where it was just make taxes lower. For us, if you look to address what Councillor Lovelace and others have been saying, if you look at what beyond the last two years of and this year and you and you look back at, you know, going back the last 10 years, the average tax increase is about 3.25%. Right. We kept it low, and I would argue artificially low, against advice from the CFO and the previous CFO, uh, and now we can't do that anymore. Uh, but, but what's interesting is that Parks and Rec vote we just had based on Councillor Kettle bringing forward that motion, which I voted against uh, removing that uh, under, uh, that will uh, result in, and I'd like staff to tell us, what does that mean the tax increase is now with taking that out? Because we didn't actually, no one asked that during the debate. I didn't think it was going to pass. So I didn't even I didn't even uh, come in and talk about it. But but to me, I, I hate to break it to both this council and to all the many aspirants lining up for the election. That discussion is the microcosm of what we're going to be talking about about every single department in 
the municipality to try and get a handle on that growth. Those are the kind of decisions that we have to make. And we made those, we have made those in the past when, when you know, several CAOs ago, it was all about vacancy management and slowing growth and pushing things off uh, operationally as much as possible. And it's not great, you know, that has certainly been a theme the 12 years that I've been here is, how come the fields are better in Bridgewater and Truro than they are here? Uh, but the scale of the growth that we have to fund is going to be driving those difficult discussions for the next little while. Uh, you know, I, I want to reiterate that I think a good look, like Councillor Outfit said, at the capital budget is important, but we need to differentiate between the important things we're investing in now and the, the massive growth pieces that we need the federal and provincial government to come into. And I think that has to be really clearly delineated. The billion dollars for transit and the, you know, probably billion dollars for water and, and wastewater uh, systems, but that can't happen unless the feds and the province come in. Uh, but staffing are, is going to be at the core of this. And I think the final, I'll just close in the 20 seconds I have left saying uh, we really need to establish what are the service levels we can live with and then we have to accept what that's going to cost, right? And we're going to have to keep having that's going to be an iterative debate going back and forth because I think that we want service levels up here, we want a Cadillac, we have the money for a Buick. How are we going to square that? So I would ask staff to confirm what the tax increase is now with that change we just made. Thank you. I'm Through Mr. Chair to the Councillor, you're now at 6.3%. And that would be on the total increase. And just with respect to your comment on the program and service review being required, um, that is a very valid comment. And when we're looking at the rate of historic tax increases, I think one thing we need to consider is that on a go forward basis and looking even historically, the rate of population growth is increasing. Now we're adding 30,000-ish people a year to HRM, but we're adding more assets to HRM every year and more kilometers of roads, which increase our operating and maintenance costs. And if we're going to look at what are our programs we're going to deliver and what are our service levels we're going to deliver, we also need to look at our assets and what we need to do to recapitalize them. And also, is there a way for us to rationalize the amount of new assets that we're receiving? Thank you, CAO. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Go ahead, Councillor Smith. I'm not sure how I keep speaking after you, Councillor Mason. Um, yeah, what a team, I guess. So I, I just want to ask about the Halifax Accelerator Fund um, funding. So I'm wondering, because we still are small ways away from approving the, the Accelerator Fund um, policy aspect of it. So I'm wondering when it comes to the staffing, is this the only time we'll be able to talk about the staff or are we uh, proving the funding generally and then as as it progresses staffing will be figured out because uh, you know things might change in what council's direction might be depending on what the draft is so I'm just wondering is this our only time to talk about staff or or this is really just approving the direction that we've approved previously so thank you for that question through the chair to councillor. Council, the council has already approved the housing accelerator fund application in its broadest terms. Right. And we have as part of that a commitment to deliver certain things and the staffing was included in that. Um, when the planning and development budget came to council, Council did approve moving forward with developing the 24-25 uh, budget based on the staffing that was included in the business plan for planning and development. What remains for Council to do is to approve the Housing Accelerator Fund uh, planning amendments and that will come forward to Council in April. We do not envision that whatever tweaks or changes Council may make through that process are going to change the staffing requirement uh, for next year. And I believe planning and development staff have yes. answered, entered the room. If I've said anything wrong, please come down and correct me. 
and the only thing just to, to hide, so for example, say that council after you know going through the process realizing that we want more emphasis to be put on hiring heritage staff in order to make sure that we deliver on the heritage districts because that's part of what we've, the protecting heritage is what we agreed on with the housing accelerator fund. Is that room there and, and staff will determine as we go forward the process that actually we should put more funding in planning planners for heritage? It, it would mean a shift within the type of staff we're trying right. to hire. But so. not, not the amount of money. Like that's, yeah. we, this, this gives enough direction where if that shift is needed, we don't need to come back to council and ask for. That is correct okay. because the staffing plan considers a certain amount of plan, planners at different levels. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. I think. I think thank you very much, Councillor Smith. Go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's not on the budget adjustment list as a number, but it was a briefing note 006 uh, for bus route number 26 uh, that I asked for uh, some options to consider improving service rather than cut the route. And so, um, it, it, and you know, part of our process is not only to approve the budget, but to approve the business plans for each department. So. Uh, just wondering what the process is for me to go with uh, staff's option number two, which was adjusting the timing of the routes uh, and how I move that forward, considering it's not a, a financial uh, consideration in the budget adjustment list. But anyway, my argument for that is that if you look at, and there's another briefing note in there on the other routes uh, and looking for efficiencies, um, this route, when you look at the uh, peak AM and PM, because it only runs peak AM and PM, and you compare it to all of the others in the latest uh, KPI report to Transportation Standing Committee in February, uh, routes 57, 58, 65, 83, 85, 86, and 415 all have lower uh, ridership uh, in those peak AM and PM periods. And uh, you know we're looking at removing this route when you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven other routes that are actually performing worse. Um, and so staff say in option number two, we can adjust the timing, especially as it relates to the school timing, but you know we don't accommodate that and HRCE should do the own, their own busing and yet we provided free transit for kids up to 12 and did a pilot and expanded the pilot for high school and junior high students to give them bus passes. So on, on, on one side of our mouth we're saying, you know, we don't want to accommodate kids, but on the other side we're saying we're making kids free and we're giving free bus passes to junior high and high school students. And so we, we can't say both at the same time. So anyway, uh, option number two, which was to adjust trip times, uh, is the one I'm looking for. I'm going to hand it over to the solicitor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, of the committee, I understand there's no no real business, or sorry, real no cost implications. So it would simply be a matter of a of a motion to amend the business plan to include op, include option number two. Okay, then I would uh, amend the business plan for transit to uh, option number two as recommended by staff. Second. Seconded by Councillor Morris. Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Cleary. Uh, I think I've said all I need Sorry, to say. Sorry, that, that's from briefing note number... 006. 006, just to be clear. Thank you. Well, it's it's funny. The, the solicitor says no funny. So it's not listed in the budget adjustment list as a number. Uh, because transit said when they were here, well then they'll just have to operationalize things differently because they were going to use obviously the resources from that route and put them somewhere else. But that means they have to keep the resources on that route. Um, so it, it's just what they have to do. It's not going to cost them anymore. They just can't move those resources. Uh, good morning, Dave Rigi, Executive Director, Halifax Transit, uh, through the chair to the committee. So, so yeah, so just, just for, for clarity, what, what uh, the staff suggestion would be is that um, in my budget presentation, we had set aside about 10,000 service hours uh, to, to work on service reliability. So essentially this would come out of that, and it's about, uh, I think it's about seven, 800 hours would come out of that. And yes, so 
I would rather, and I'm not saying let's keep it forever, but when it was the number five, it had much better ridership. Of course, the number five used to go downtown as well. This is a tiny little route that goes into Springvale, goes back out to Mumford and rotates around AM peak, several uh, routes, AM, uh, or PM peak, several route runs. But it doesn't line up with the people who are using it, which is one of the reasons why I get complaints that it doesn't work for them. So if we adjusted those, tried it, and ridership doesn't go up or goes up marginally, fine, next year, but let's cut it and we'll put the resources somewhere else. But I would hate to see us because um, this is almost in the urban course, just on the other side of Joe Howe. I would, I would hate to see us cut it when, again, we have the 57, 58, 65, 83, 85, 86, and the 415 all performing at lower AM peak, PM peak operation. Thank you. Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so just, uh, Dave, you mentioned that the hours would come out of a general sort of improvement. So um, if we do this, which, you know, whenever, whenever we've kind of uh, looked at cutting routes generally, I mean, our practice has always been a little bit of flexibility, whether it was Sambro Loop or Purcell's Cove, we've tried other scenarios oftentimes when, when the local councillor is asked. So I'm somewhat uh, agreeable to doing the same here for that, but uh, I just want to know if we do this, what what do we give up in terms of those hours instead? So the committee may recall what I did my budget presentation. We had a, a set of service changes that were, um, you know, per, per specific route, and then there was a bundle of hours that we were going to do uh, that we were putting aside basically to allow our operations department to deal with things like overloads, lateness on a, on an operational ongoing basis. So basically. You know, I couldn't say this will impact a specific route in a specific way because it is kind of the dynamic operational impact. Um, what it will do is it will take, um, you know, a, a little less than 10% of the resources I was going to give my operations team to deal with those things away. So um, they'll still have the other, you know, 900 or sorry, 9,000 plus service hours to work with, but it is a bit of a reduction. Okay, so we, if I'm understanding then this is, you basically have this flexibility piece because I mean we're seeing overloads on thing on, you know, some of our corridor routes, like it, it takes from there, is that kind of the idea then? But we don't know exactly where? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the challenge was, um, so there were some overloads on the Route 90 which were repeatable and predictable, so we proposed changes to that route to address those. Um, when our team dug into the overloads uh, throughout the rest of the system, they were very inconsistent. So we couldn't actually take service hours and you know assign them to a specific route. So that so this was the approach instead to basically give us extra buses, extra drivers out there that we can dynamically uh, use as issues arise to help fill trips to uh, and you know help uh, in areas where we have overloads. Okay, uh, last question. Um, if we do as Councillor Clary is asking on this, um, would this then come back next year with a, did that work, did it not? Um, it, it certainly can. I mean, typically when we make a change, we, we want to give it uh, 12 to 18 months before okay. we can really see any kind of change in, in, in patterns. Um, the other thing is we are going to be going into our, our service planning process next year. So, I mean, all of this is going to more or less go back into the mixer anyway for any kind of service, service changes. But, um, I mean, if it was Council's will, we could certainly bring information back and there will be information in our regular reporting anyway, but we would normally want to wait more than one year. To, okay. to assess something. Okay, thank you. There are no further speakers on the list at this moment, so we'll call for the question on the amendment. And we vote. <laughs> Councillor Stoddard, is there a question? Sorry. Or I'll do it. <laughs> no, thank you, Miss Ms. Chair. Okay. Yes.
That motion is carried. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, my question was uh, with regards to the uh, the fare, transit fare increase, and I'm just wondering, um, when was the last transit fare increase? And what would uh, the, uh, the increase bring the um, adult fares up to? What would the uh, total cost be for a single fare trip? Uh, hello again, Dave Riggi, Executive Director of Halifax Transit. Um, through, the uh, through the chair of the committee, the, the last fare increase was September 2019, um, and it would be a, a 25 cent increase on the adult cash fare, which, uh, yeah, that should bring it up to like, $3, and uh, then it's just proportional throughout all the other fare categories. Okay, uh, and is there any uh, reduction uh, do you, is there savings in buying tickets? Is there savings in using the, uh, the app? Um. Yeah, so, so we, within our different fare categories, there are, there are different discounts right now, basically based on volume. So if you buy a monthly pass, you're gonna get a bigger uh, discount on a per ride basis. Generally, tickets, you get a bit of a discount, but um, the single, single ride or cash share is definitely the most expensive per trip, usually. Gotcha. Yep. And uh, more people will take other options, other, I would say the vast majority of folks use the other options rather than cash in the, uh, in the till sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, it does vary. I mean, people will do, people will generally do either, you know, uh, what, what they have available, if cash, what they have available, it's what they'll use. But, you know, a lot of our regular users will do that math and go, you know, I'm gonna be commuting to work 20 days this week or whatever, I'll, I'll buy a monthly pass. If it's less than that, maybe tickets make sense. Or mm -hmm. through the fare app now, we have week passes, day passes. So uh, typically people are doing that kind of analysis into what's, what makes sense for them. All right, perfect, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Councillor Hensby. On that matter of the, of the fare increase stuff, uh, so it, just to clarify, is it in the recommendation to include 25 cents or not to include it? Because it's a little confusing in trying to read this from the sheet. The transit fare increase is built in. And built in, okay. All right, and um, and going with, uh, when we talk about the free we give to, to, to the school kids and we have the seniors day uh, pass in the afternoon. Um, how, many, how many universities now have a U-Pass program? Have all the universities and the community colleges now on the U-Pass? Uh, yes, that's correct. All, all the degree granting institutions uh, in HRM have it, along with NSCC and uh, numerous private colleges as well. So our career colleges also have it now? Yep. Great. Uh, how many of our major employers are getting on a transit program? Uh, I don't have the number handy. It's certainly something I can provide, but we are seeing good growth and good interest uh, in the employer pass program as well. Okay. and. Um and also with the app and stuff, there we, so we can discount rates easily with the electronic uses. Because I, I think a lot of people now are just throwing three bucks in the cash box anyway. And there are not too many people you know, fill around quarters anymore. So I just find that with three bucks is probably much more simpler to throw in than trying to find the quarters, put 275 in. So um, I'll be in support of the, the, the fare increase. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Um, Councillor Cleary. Well, I jumped the queue, look at that. Uh, that's all good. Um, well, I was on the fare increase, so I just, clarification. The budget adjustment list currently has it listed as an over, meaning uh, we asked for a briefing note on removing that. So just to clarify the list that we have in front of us, do we have to take each one of these and move them as unders or overs or vice versa, uh, if you want to reverse them. Um, or are they just built in now? Because the CAO said it's built in, but we, we said let's not build it in. We said let's remove it. Through the chair to the councillor, that is correct. You'd ask okay. us to look at removing it. However, the staff recommendation that's come back 
is to leave it in. Yeah. And that's reflected in the wording of the motion of uh, the report for today. Yeah. We will and have to- And you used to, the exact same words too when you were speaking. We'll have to adjust to. the final motion um, that gets approved today to reflect whatever briefing notes or budget adjustment list items have either been added or removed. All right, so taking that then, I will move that we remove the 25 cent fare increase. Second. I got a few. Yeah, well I would expect, yeah, you'd have probably a draft of each of the ones that are on here. Uh, so just very quickly on that then, uh, and I found it interesting both in the briefing note what the CAO said, is we're transferring the burden to general taxpayers. Um, so that, so transit's costs are going to cost us $145.5 million this year. The area rate's 40.9, other revenue is 1.2, the general rate's 68.2, fares are 34.9. So the total tax burden is already 109.1 million. So I'm not sure adding point, literally 0.4% of the transit budget is transferring the burden to the general taxpayer when the general taxpayer is already picking up 68 million of it. Uh, and the area rate payers are picking up 40.1 or 40.9 million of it. And so from 109 million dollars to 109,000 uh, is really not that extra burden when it's already been stated by a number of people, we are transferring the burden to the people we are trying to actually get on the bus. The integrated mobility plan says we have a mode shift target of 30% by 2030. We wanna get only 70%, remember we're growing in the wrong direction. We wanna get 70% of people on buses walking, cycling. Or uh, yeah, 30% uh, of people on buses walking and cycling. 70% because it was at 77%, we wanna get that down in terms of who's actually using a car, especially a single occupied vehicle. And so I'm not sure how when we just a few years ago increased it, and we're having service issues. We've taken buses off the road. We have overloads growing. We can say to people, hey, we can justify an extra fare for you when we can't even provide the services that you should be getting. And so we don't say to people, hey, I know you're only a pedestrian, you don't drive, but guess what? Tens, of, tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars of your taxpayer money is going to paving roads. Not building roads, just repaving a road. And so transferring the burden, I thought was really interesting language to use when we already have a system that is 75% paid for by tax dollars. So going to 75.4% paid by tax dollars is not a huge burden. The chair to the councillor, um, that is correct. It's really $700,000 and I think that works out to 2.61 cents per year per taxpayer or an increase of 0.1%. If you're gonna use that kind of language, take the 145 or even the 109 million, 109 million being paid for by a general and area rate. How much is that on the tax burden currently? And then say how much the extra cents are. I do apologize if the use of the term burden has caused any offense. However, the entire municipal budget process has been talking about the average tax burden on residents. Councillor Outhead. I agree with Sean's comments. Thank you. <laughs> That's it, Councillor Outhead? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sounds good. <laughs> Councillor Hensby. Well, I happen to disagree with Mr. Cleary's comments. So. Uh, you know, in regards to shifting the tax burden, you know, it'd be different if you're going to shift it to the local transit rate because you're putting, if you're not gonna put it on the bus fares for the user's fees, then just put it on the local transit rate. Not on the general rate, because why should people in Sheet Harbor be paying for bus services they don't even get? You know, bus get out of Harbor, Port, Porter's like got barely a service there. Lawrence have been begging for service. You know, I just can't see us uh, putting this onto the general rate. If you wanna put the shift the tax burden, then shift it on the areas that was being used, and that's the local transit rate. So I'll, I'll be supporting the increase in the fare, and if, if that doesn't pass, then I, uh, then I request that it goes on the local transit rate and not the general rate. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, man. 
it's opposite day. It's uh, uh, Tim and Sean on one side, Hensby and Mason on the other, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. So I, I support the fee increase. Uh, here, here are my thoughts. One is, uh, there's no evidence anywhere in the world that free transit increases use, other than a little bit of people doing more short trips who are already using, using transit anyway. Like when you look at the very few places that have tried this, hasn't really driven it. And this is coming from a guy who is, this is gonna hit me in the pocketbook. I, I, I have said to Dave, and I said at Transportation Standing Committee, since the app came in, my use of transit has skyrocketed because it's just so easy and um, it's cold and wet and rainy and I'm being lazy and I'm taking the bus probably twice a day right now during the work week. Uh, I should get back on the annual pass. Uh, the, I am a big believer philosophically that we should establish what the fees and permit costs are, including fares, and then, and it should be based on this is what we think is fair, and then we should index it. It should go up every year. We, like, like otherwise, you end up in the position we were in uh, where uh, the transit fare hadn't changed for a really long time when I first got elected, or where we have all these builder's permits and stuff that are the lowest in the country that are, are way, way lower than they should be. Um, so, uh, you know, the fare has, even with this increase and the last increase, and I did this because I had a constituent who asked, the fare going to $3 is still below inflation for the last 10 years. We are not keeping pace with inflation. So I'm at peace with it. It's also not $3.35, which is what it is in Toronto, where they have a much better transit system, so then they pay more, right? So, so I'm okay with it. I'm gonna, I, I, I'm not, I'm not gonna support uh, the reduction. Uh, and this is as someone who, you know, when I'm on the bus, uh, there are lots of people who are on the bus who are uh, uh, moderate to uh, higher income earners. Uh, so this goes back to what are we going to do to help seniors and youth and low income people, the stuff we were talking about earlier, make sure that we're providing targeted support rather than across the board support. While this is going to hit me in the pocket, I can afford it. I'm happy to pay it. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of transit users, there's no argument that transit is cheaper than owning another car or even using commune auto, which I'm also a member of, or any of those things. So uh, I'm comfortable supporting this increase because it's so modest. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Councillor Purdy. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Chair. Um, so you beat me to it. I, my only, my only um, caveat was I didn't want this to be transferred to the uh, tax rate. So I'm going to propose an amendment to uh, Councillor Cleary's uh, amendment uh, or motion that we finalize a proposed operating budget for regional council that includes a one-time reserve with withdrawal of $700,000 from the Central Library Reserve, Q536. Yeah, I'm adding an amendment. Yes, that's right. Pay attention. To include in, <laughs> to be included in the 24-25 uh, proposed operating budget to increase Halifax Transit's operating budget. Is that a friendly? It's, would you would you be? Is there a is there a seconder for that motion? No. Uh, well, just uh, Madam Chair, you can't amend an amendment. So unless oh. unless the mover and the seconder agree, it's friendly. Then we'll have to deal with that next. Is it friendly? How, how we pay for it can be a secondary discussion. I'm open to the area rate. I'm open to the general rate. I'm open to a reserve, although generally speaking, I don't think we should pay for operating things out of reserves. But anyway, that's a, a discussion we can have. Uh, but it's not friendly. I think it's a separate issue of how we pay for it. It's the principle. It's the principle. Yeah, okay, that's fine. That's fine. But um, my, my question is, uh, if ridership increases, which is the goal, of course, of Halifax Transit, will this $700,000 and next year it goes up to 1.2 million, will that be necessary? Like what, what if that 20% uh, ridership increase happens this year that gets us back up to pre-COVID levels? So, 
I think that would be difficult for me to answer. It's a bit of a, a bit of a crystal ball question as to what happens next year. I mean, you know, ultimately we prepared the budget this year for you know our best estimates, and and you know, as I said during my budget budget presentation, we do take conservative estimates when we do um, ridership growth because I don't want to be back here explaining a a, a budget deficit you know next year. Um, you know, could we grow enough to cover that? I mean, it's possible. Is it something I could project right now or, or tell council as my advice? I could not do that right now. The, there's far too many unknowns in my view. Okay, I, I'll obviously going to be supporting this and um, I'll come back then with the payment option. Thank you, Councilor Purdy. Councilor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, so just a real quick question. Uh, if uh, the uh, Councillor Cleary's motion passes, then uh, earlier it was stated the increase, uh, the projected increase or the requested increase in fee will go towards the expansion of service. So uh, I know others are coming, want to come forward with other ways of uh, fulfilling that gap, uh, the, the loss of not increasing the fee. So, but if that doesn't happen, if we just simply leave the fees as it is and there's no other way of, uh, no other motions come forward, how does that impact the desire to expand the, the service as stated earlier? Um, so, so ultimately, I mean, the you know the transit budget is a bucket of money, and the, the, there's you know revenue comes in, and we cover cover it off that way. Um, the my my recommendation would be if it's not on if it's not on the tax rate if it's not on the fares, um, then you look at cutting something out. And the recommendation for me would be it, it, it's again that that um, that fund of operational money to deal with service reliability, because if if you don't do that, then we have to get into what routes are we cutting or what routes are we not uh, right. expanding or improving as per the annual service plan. Okay, uh, thank you. Dr. Mayor. Councilor Lovelace. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, so I'm not gonna support this amendment. You know, I think uh, if I heard this correctly, we're looking at five years ago, we had an increase. And was it a quarter then, Dave? 25 cents, yeah. So 25 cents uh, each fi every five years and considering the massive costs right now that we've seen, the increase in costs uh, to operations, I'm totally fine with the 25 cents. I think we've now jumped from 6.2 to 6.3. Where are we going next? I just, I just think we're going in the wrong direction. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna support this. And thank you uh, for looking at savings. I mean, again, that is what this committee said. Look at savings, bring savings forward. And that's what staff are trying to do. So. Thank you, Halifax Transit. Thanks, Dave. I see no further speakers on the list. Is there a call for the question? Um, Motion has failed. May I? May I? <laughs> Our legal counsel has. Okay. Um, so we, this afternoon, you know, we've got six minutes left. Uh, fire is not available this afternoon. Any counselors have any further questions for fire that they would like to have addressed before we break for lunch and fire needs to leave? Um, Councilor Mancini, is a question for fire? It's a question for the procedure. So my, my concern is, so if fire, I don't have a question for fire at this point in time, but as conversation may go this afternoon, there may be a question for fire. So what happens if that occurs? We, come back, Tuesday. we, we, we can continue come continue back tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay. I, unfortunately, fire has a memorial they have to attend. Yeah, no, I understand. So, uh, yeah, but uh, we can uh, come uh, back tomorrow. Okay, so thank you. Councilor Purdy, do you have a question for fire? Councilor Hensby? Thank you. Um, well, it, it is 5-2. Uh, thank you, 
to uh, fire for being present here today. We appreciate that this morning. And uh, we'll take a break for lunch, but when we come back, we will go in camera. Uh, so we'll be back at one o'clock. Thank you very much, everyone. Can we have a motion to move in camera? Motion. Thank you.
Are we good to go? Uh, okay. All right, folks, we are back on our budget uh, adjustment list as part of our budget process. Uh, Councillor Austin, I'll go to you uh, first of all. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Sister Mayor. I move that Budget Committee adopt the amendment to the main motion as discussed in camera and direct that the private and confidential report dated March 27, 2024 be maintained private and confidential. Second by Councillor Lovelace. Are we ready for the question? That's carried, thank you. We're back on the main motion now as amended. Councillor uh, Austin. Uh, oh, I'm good. Yeah. Councillor Cleary on the main motion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, so in uh, clause one of the motion, the main motion, uh, it was all the balance adjustment uh, items uh, one to five, seven to 14. I would like to remove uh, balance adjustment or ba budget adjustment list item number 14, which is the RCMP enhancement of six additional officers uh, to remove those from uh, the budget adjustment list. Okay, Councillor Cleary is... Uh, so that's on the, that hasn't been moved to be brought forward. It was in the no, it was in the original motion. Okay, so Councillor Cleary is suggesting that that be taken off the uh, the list of those to be a approved on the main motion, right? <clears throat> okay, second for that. Councillor Smith seconds the motion. Councillor Cleary. Uh, same argument I had when we had the RCMP and the HRP here. We uh, added, what's funny, interesting. we said let's hold it off Let's see what community safety has. Uh, we got that, public safety, we're doing a whole bunch of things, we're adding a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, but then we added 22 police officers in HRP and now we're adding six RCMP. And Councillor Mason so eloquently said just earlier that we're adding too many bodies to our staff. And so uh, this is one area where we don't have to add. Uh, we already have, if you compare us to a lot of other cities across Canada, uh, more police per population. And so this is one, and I'm, I'm not gonna test you on HRP because I'm not gonna get two thirds to rescind that one. Uh, but this is one where uh, we're in a tough budget year. We've already got loads of police officers uh, and I think uh, we could save six right here. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Well, Mr. Mayor, I won't be supporting that motion is on the floor. I believe we heard through our presentations, especially the need for uh, officers in the rural parts of Halifax uh, because of our numbers, or lack of numbers, and also I believe the um, sexual assault and, uh, and uh, issues and with uh, domestic violence and stuff that we thought we were having some dedicated personnel to deal with those matters. So uh, I, uh, I will not be supporting the motion at all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I won't be supporting it as well, and I ask that Council consider not supporting this. It's, that's not it, what Councillor Clary noted as being the rationale just doesn't cut it for me. Um, it's uh, not enough. We are growing, and the RCMP have had not had an increase in uh, a number of years, and we are growing and our rural areas are growing, and that's where most of this service is being delivered, the RCMP, and um, we, we use that rationale with a, our HRP, and, and rightly so. The growth is, it's already here. The crime is already here, and we cannot, in good faith to the public, to the residents that we all, that put us here, um, leave that gap. So. I would ask that Council not vote for this motion and continue to support the appropriate amount of policing in this municipality during our period of growth um, and uh, many, many challenges. In particular, I think that it's important and the Councillor mentioned our public safety office. We also have many uh, reasons to support the, the public safety office work in tandem and in collaboration with our policing services. The two go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And if our chief is here asking for more bodies, then it's our, I believe it's our responsibility, knowing what's to come and knowing what's already here to support it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, should be no surprise that I won't be supporting this. Uh, you know, rural and suburban policing have been underfunded. And uh, for the past three years, I've been talking about the importance of looking at, uh, from a women's lens, domestic violence is extremely important uh, to address. RCMP uh, have identified a long caseload and they have identified a means to address this. Uh, I think that um, it's disingenuous actually to even suggest uh, to the rural communities that we remove policing uh, when the communities have consistently said we need more police, especially when you look at how few police are policing this growing area as um, our chair of the police commission has just addressed in Hammonds Plains West Bedford, District 13 in particular, and of course in District 16, um, you know, we've, we're, we're adding uh, over 12,000 units where we consistently see a lack of police officers because we don't have enough. And uh, anyway, I will stop there. I just, this is um, absolutely our bread and butter, Mr. Mayor. This is why we're here as a council, is to ensure that uh, we provide policing to our constituents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and ditto, like public safety is, is one of our core, core responsibilities. We owe this to our residents. There's specialized uh, policing um, positions that are going to be filled here with this RCMP ask, and it, they're needed, uh, like Councillor Lovelace has said, and um, just, I mean, even response, service response times um, are, are challenged in rural areas, so no, we'll be not supporting this. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So, um, to say that we've got enough policing, um, not test HRP, but okay to, to look at the RCMP component and say that we don't need six more, um, I would have a hard time understanding that a little bit. But I, I do know that, you know, earlier we talked about what do people expect for their taxes, and if you're thinking suburban and rural, then the biggest things, things that they say is fire and police and rec. Um, in Fall River, we've been looking and having a lot of conversations with RCMP about where are they. The Sackfall detachment seems to be too far away, too busy. Uh, Middle Muscadabba, great new station down there. Um, but then again, we're looking at, if you're looking at the St. Mary's back road and Dean and all those kind of things, there just isn't enough uh, officer presence when we need them. I can tell you that I can drive those rural roads um, quite a lot, just look at my mileage, um, and I can tell you how many times I've seen an RCMP uh, car because they're just so busy where they are, and sometimes detracted away as well. So I do know that in our community, they would like to see uh, more of an RCMP presence, and we would like to see a community um, policing officer even uh, in Fall River, so I, I cannot support removing this from the, the bow list. I think that it's needed. Um, and I think it's probably, when we look at all of the things that what districts, how they benefit from this budget and what they see in it, this is one place where urban and suburban would see that they benefit, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and I've, I've said in the past that I, I support not doing this and only because really the biggest piece, so I understand the rural aspect and, and the, you know, the, the information that we were sh shared from the RCMP related to response times, I, I, I get that. For me, the biggest piece that makes me not want to support this is the aspect of adding the officers for, for domestic violence and, and, and that is what is difficult for me because we saw from the mass casualty report that the way that current investigations and case handling is done needs to be revamped and, and we need to take a really deep look at it and, to, and what I feel from this is it's just adding more bodies to do the same thing when we have a pretty thoughtful report saying that we can't. So for me, this is the, that's the thing that makes me not able to, to vote for, for this is, is um, I, I, I don't want us to go down that road status quo, understanding that we have to, to change that view. So understanding the, the need for, for rural response, I, I, I can support that, but um, adding the bodies for the, the domestic violence, 
piece it just doesn't doesn't sit well for me so that's why I'm voting to remove it thank you thank you Councillor Stoddard thank you mr. mayor I have a suburb which is district 12 and the Tantalan RCMP dis detachment is stretched. They covered, like I said, they cover District 12, which includes Beachville, Lakeside, and Timberley. And this area needs Tantalan RCMP detachment. So I cannot support this motion. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Mayor and Chair. Is there a, an opportunity for us to ask Chief Christie um, just about those positions that are in question around the domestic violence and how they would be revamping and relooking at how that how those positions work? That's why he is here, <clears throat> and I know he's paying attention. So I invite uh, <clears throat> Chief Superintendent Christie. Your Worship, through you to um, the Deputy Mayor, through I think by extension to Councillor Lindell Smith. <clears throat> so the first part is right now, our model for intimate partner violence calls are traditionally taken by somebody on the watch. And the watch for Council, the conversation, the example I've used before is very much like the emergency room. It's whoever's working, gets a call, we deploy. Most of those resources are on four on, four off, right? The second part is when, when you are on that model of general duty, you're sort of the jack of all trades and master of none, right? Because again, you might be dealing with impaired files, you might be dealing with break and enters, <clears throat> you're dealing with the whole gamut, de-escalation. So the concept that we've put before the police board uh, and then through council is that dedicated domestic violence or intimate partner violence investigators would develop greater expertise particularly for high risk matters. And we, we use an ADERA uh, risking sheet out of Ontario where they, we triage and we look at each case from a safety planning perspective in terms of lethality. And that's basically what that ODERA checklist is about. And then we would take such files and take them away from the emergency room and put them in a specialist team. And I would advocate that the Mass Casualty Commission and other police agencies across the country such as in Vancouver Island, where because of the mobile nature of many victims and also uh, perpetrator suspects, um, the specialized team model has been much more successful at cross-jurisdictional issues, as well as just developing greater expertise. So I would, I would respectfully suggest to the deputy mayor's question that actually um, funding intimate partner violence investigators is a evolution and innovation um, respectfully matching kind of the spirit of your question to do things differently, to do things better. And that's why we call it an enhancement where the argument for the four watch members are for what core policing adequate and effective. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Councillor Outhit. Thank you, Mayor, and, and Jeff, if you'd mind staying there. So my, my takeaway from this, and I still, you know, I've said this from the beginning, I am such a believer in detasking and retasking when po where possible, but also domestics, domestic violence and domestic incidents are one of the most violent things that police respond to. And, and how many times have we seen an officer investigating a domestic dispute was, was stabbed or shot so, you know, I'm not convinced you can just call a social worker and send them in to this, to this situation. I do think that police with special training should be there. I don't think they should be tying up patrol for eight or 12 hours. I do believe that there are things that non-police should be doing as part of that situation or before you get to that situation that police are called to respond to a, uh, a domestic. But to think that, you know, that the police suddenly are not going to be able to respond to domestic, the first thing somebody's going to do when they respond to a violent situation is they call for police backup. And in the situation, we're fortunate enough that sometimes that our CRO or our school officers will do that so you don't have to take them out of patrol. But that's not always the case. So this is, this is I'm sp speaking what I believe to be the truth, Jeff, and you can 
you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. The other situation is I, I feel badly for it. I actually experienced it once myself, and I shared this to council before, and I shared it with police. I called the RCMP when I was in Sackville, and the only officers on duty were responding to a situation in, Winds in the Fall River at the time. I had somebody in front of me that should not have been driving at the time, and the officer that responded, and I attended and stayed there keeping an eye on this person, so the officer came from Windsor. So, to an urban area such as Sackville. So, anyway, I, I'm afraid that while I want detasking and retasking to be done and, and additional services for people needing help, I just don't think we're there yet. Plus, the, when I was first elected to council, a lot of our rural areas were emptying out. Well, they're not emptying out anymore, they're growing. And we've admitted that we need more police and fire and bus drivers and plows and whatnot as, as areas grow. So why would the rural areas who have grown not require some additional policing? It, it's just not logical to me. So Jeff, if you have any thoughts on this. Okay, sir, uh, sorry, Superintendent Christie. Sir, you can call me whatever you want yeah. to call me. Except late for dinner, I know. Your Worship, through you to the Councillor and the Committee. Um, so really two points. Um, and some on council are, are, are very wonderful advocates of this area, and they would say that we know intimate partner violence is significantly underreported. Yeah. So if we brought math, more or less, to say that there's five or 600 calls a year, and out of that grouping, let's say 150 are high risk, the real number would be eight or 10, if not 12 times that. So. The Crown Attorney in, in the province as well as moving to sort of dedicate two Crown Prosecutors as specialists in this area because, again, the lethality of domestic violence, intimate partner violence can become an attempted homicide file or can become a homicide file in sort of a uh, disproportionate amount of time. So the reality is we... I would advocate, I would share that this is a decision by council and we respect the decision where we can do a little bit better by finding perhaps even investigators that match the gender of most victims. Often, mm. uh, I don't want to say all victims of intimate partner violence are female, but uh, mathematically and numerically they are. Mm. So we, we can look at fine tuning our service delivery so that the victim at 2 a.m. in the morning is going to get emergency room support and then triage them over to a specialized team for the following days that will work for victim service planning, safety planning, et cetera, uh, because victims are in every part of HRM, whether they're in the downtown urban yeah. core yeah. or they're actually in the urban areas. And there is some research in uh, by um, uh, Stats Canada that would show rural areas may be at slightly greater risk of domestic violence because victims may be slightly more isolated. Mm. Um, so that would be my comment, Your Worship. Okay. All right, colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> the motion of the, is on the floor of Councillor Cleary. Ready for the question. That motion is defeated. So we're back on the main. Motion, is this our list, uh, Ian? Councillor Mancini. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I wanted to follow up on uh, some questioning that Councillor Moore has brought forward earlier with, re, um, uh, with regard to her area and the challenges of food and such. Uh, I wonder if Letitia could come forward. Uh, that would be appreciated. So, Letitia, you know, Councillor Moore has talked about her district and she made some comparisons with Dartmouth North, which I, which I agree with, but, but the lack of services and the volunteer groups that's there that's providing uh, food and, uh, and how under-supported uh, they are uh, with resources. And she asked about, you know, the importance of the Just Food Program as being pr uh, proposed. My question is, what's being proposed, though, for this Just Food Program if it was approved today and that becomes reality, 
how many more families will receive food that were not receiving food before in, in this next year, in this year? Patricia? To the chair, to the councillor. Uh, if we do the breakdown of sort of municipally led programs, I mean, I would see those organizations that are doing great work in our communities be supported by having an increased number of places where they could work on food distribution, we could increase food literacy, we could support food production, we could use municipal resources like, like the, uh, the food truck and others to increase the distribution of food. So. I can't quantify exactly how many more people would be supported through but that. But there would be more people. More people, and yeah. we, we have performance indicators that will support that and will give you those numbers when we report back to council in the fall of next year, when we, we have our report back on, uh, on everything that's been done with the Just Food program. We certainly can do things like advocating for land use bylaw changes, changes to municipal policy, policy, changes to municipal initiatives and investment to make sure that they're factoring in access to food, factoring in you know things like spaces to grow food, and increasing the opportunities for people to grow their own food, which we heard as a, as a key priority. When we think about uh, what would happen if have, we have a food council in place, you know, what that would mean is uh, these organizations could have access to low barrier grants and there would be supports in place to help them make it easier for them to access those funds. So they would have support for applications, they would have support for performance measurement and, you know, being able to tell the story of how those those funds are helping people in their community. So we would have clear articulation of how those funds are resulting in more food in people's bellies, resulting in more local food being produced and shared, and you know, food being used as a tool for community development. Um, we also think about when we have a food council, a re well-resourced food council there, those organizations could also tap into finding out more about what food activities are happening in their region. They could learn more about you know, what others are doing, what are best practices across the world from our connection through the Milan Pact. You know, they have access to a lot of different resources like food assessment toolkits that help them to get a really clear picture of what the issues are so that they can better target their services to meet the need, but also to, you know, to share with others what's working, what isn't, and maybe find some synergies and some efficiencies that wouldn't be there if they weren't having those conversations and connecting. Uh, the, the Resource Food Council could also help to host, you know, those conversations, that information sharing, really providing that connecting and coordinating role, which we heard throughout our engagements with these organizations as a real missing piece in this landscape. Everybody is so busy doing their work with their head down that they don't have the opportunity to find out what others are doing. Mm. So they can find those efficiencies, they can share those resources to better serve people in the community and have more food and bellies and a more localized food system. Um, as I said, you know, there's that knowledge and research as, as well around best practices, what's working, what is the research saying as the key, key needs, what is the research saying as key interventions and initiatives, so that sharing of resources. But there's also an organizing and mobilizing as well around the Just Food Action Plan. So we have a, an approved Just Food Action Plan. We've done thousands of hours of community engagement that has told us that this is what people want the food strategy for our region to achieve. So the Food Council can use Just Food as a mobilizing, and these organizations can use this as a mobilizing way of framing what are our priorities and our recommendations for change moving forward as well. So it's a, you know, it's a way of mobilizing and advocating for big changes and tracking things like school food, which was mentioned earlier. You know, our role there as a municipality was to advocate for school food. We, we did sign on, council did endorse uh, the school food um, to, the, to the federal government as being important. Then we can use the Food Council to basically provide some information around how do we tailor a school food program to meet the individual school needs, knowing that what's happening at JL Ilsley versus what's happening at Oxford School is going to be a very different school food program, so we can ma capitalize on the resources and the networks of the Food Council to better inform what a school food program looks like on the ground. So. So that's a long, <laughs> long answer there. There's a, there's a lot of stuff there that will result Councilor, in Councilor, if you want to say anything else, you'll have to come back. Okay. Councilor Cuddle. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and uh, Leticia, I'm going to ask about food too, so don't, so don't move. Um, so, I mean, looking through this and looking through the report, we, like we know the budget next year is going to come back at, um, you know, about $900,000 and the program is like at about a $1.3 million budget, which is a significant budget. And, you know, some of the things that um, I have issue with here are that a lot of this is outside of our core service delivery. What I do like about the plan as it is now is that you have identified a number of great things that are municipal led, um, such as you know growing our capacity for action, um, maximizing our assets for food, um, and strengthening our emergency food planning, um, which you know talk about those kind of land use bylaws, those community gardens, like providing the expertise for food production you know, perhaps in our parks or on HRM land or on other areas of the community. Where, where I start to have a bit of a problem is where I see we have, um, you know, the Food Council, you, you know, we're looking at, you know, $251,000 to deliver $186,000 in grants. So when the administration looks greater than like, you know, the grants or the money that's going into the community, I, 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 you know, it kind of makes me wonder how efficient are we? Because if the main goal is really about supporting those community organizations and getting kind of food into the bellies of those who need it, um, I, I, I just, one, um, wonder about the numbers, but two, wonder about what our role is in this. Is it our role to be monitoring the provincial school food program? Um, I don't think it is. Um, definitely we should be a partner at the table, but that isn't us to, con you know, to convene that table. And so when I look at, you know, the original ask for this was, was $522,000 is what was needed to, uh, I think was the original ask. We found some additional money within the budget uh, that reduced that to 250. And when I look at the, how much it costs for the municipal led initiatives, it's 193,200 is what we have out, out of that $900,000. It's only 193 that are for the municipal led initiatives. So I would like to see, you know, our emphasis being on the things that are within our wheelhouse that we could, do, you know, make a difference on the ground in prov providing grants for community gardens and, mm -hmm. and, you know, providing a contribution to the food grants, but not being the core funding for all of that. We need our other partners to come to the table. Um, I just. I see my time is up, but I'm just wondering if you have any responses to any of that, first of all. Leticia. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Um, the budget number for sort of municipally led, exclusively municipally led, is about 230,000 if you include the food asset map in there. Uh, there's about 185,000 allocated for the community grants, so those would go through the food council be peer reviewed, um, you know, be distributed based on the principles of the Just Food Action Plan. So there is, as you say, an administrative role there. There is some uh, resourcing needed to establish those grants to make sure that they're they're distributed equitably and fairly, and you'll know, have a, a very solid peer review process that's aligned with the principles of the action plan. Uh, there's also the advisory circle, which is going to continue to help to advance the Just Food Action Plan. They're going to be running the 29 indicator uh, performance measurement and monitoring framework. So this is really a very robust set of indicators that are going to measure how well our programs are influencing. So to back to Councillor Mancini's question, so how many people are participating in these programs, how much food is being moved within community, new gardening, et cetera, um, but also to, to continue to measure and learn more about the vulnerabilities in our community and also, uh, you know, what the state of the health is of our food system, which is really important for informing policy and, and changes moving forward. So there's that indicator. There's also the connection to our advisory groups, our African Nova Scotian and Black advisory group and our Indigenous advisory group who are really building on that just food principle of the importance of communities 
being the ones who devise the solutions that suit their communities and the need to build food sovereignty and ownership into our food system. So that's why we have those distinct bodies and recognize that it's important that they're funded and that that leadership comes from within community as opposed to being from outside of community. So there's, you know, that's an important part of the work as well. Um, there's also, uh, you know, funding within that uh, funding for the Food Council to have community participation in these conversations. Because while the Food Policy Alliance has done some great work, it has really been a place of privilege. And the only people who have been able to participate are those who are paid by their organizations to be able to be there. And if this is really about community-based and community-led action, you need to have all of the voices at the table. So it's important to have funding there to make sure that community can participate and we reduce some of the barriers that have been in place for community okay. to participate. All right, I think, I think you've answered my questions there. Yeah. I know my time is up, so I will come back. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Leticia. When I listen to you, I know that you live and breathe this program. <laughs> it is definitely something that uh, you know you're you're so well equipped for. Again, I think my my worry really is where is the province's money in this program? Uh, so that might be one. And then the other thing is, you know, when I think about. Um, I wouldn't want anyone thinking that this is the only place where HRM provides, uh, you know, for food security or to insecurity and in that, you know, we have the grants program, we have the, um, for those that own their own building, we have the tax relief for their nonprofits. So there are other places where we do contribute uh, as a municipality. And then, so when I, when I listen about the community grants program, that would be peer reviewed. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Just the risk about another group deciding where tax dollars are going to a group. Like, so could you tell me a little bit more so I'll understand that a little bit better on the peer review for the grants that are part of this Just Food program? Please, thank you. Okay, do you chair to the councillor. Uh, just to speak to the first question about where the province is in this. Um, I would say based on my conversations with provincial staff is they're focused on the urgent issue of you know, food and bellies. So for example, they just made a $5 million investment through United Way and the food banks, which was uh, spoken for within a week. The, the de demand and the need was so great for food and bellies that $5 million was basically gone in a, in a week. Um, so that's where they're focusing in is on, you know, that capacity building to get food out the door to people. Um, they're also doing some work around, um, you know, sort of collaborative food networks. So for example, they've just made an investment for 200,000 in uh, the Preston Township for uh, these food sheds that are, are used for sharing food, so similar to a food pantry that we see in some of our other uh, communities. And uh, you know, we're quite hopeful that there's gonna be an announcement fairly soon that the Community Economic Development Fund is going to be making a close to million dollar investment in the regional food hub, which would be Halifax-based infrastructure for connecting local food with uh, local demand for local food. Um, so that's, I think, something positive on the horizon in terms of the province in this work. And, and we do continue to meet with the province and we see the creation of some seed money for the Food Council as being the first step in bringing other investors and funders and foundations to the table to increase the capacity and the role and the impact of the Food Council for addressing this huge issue that really requires collective impact and collaborative governance to do things differently rather than you know, continuing to put money into urgent need that doesn't necessarily change the situation on the ground. So that's sort of where we see, see the province in this. Um, in terms of uh, the peer review, I mean, it's really making sure that we have lots of different voices at the table. So for example, uh, the Shibakto Connections who were heavily involved in the development of the plan, you know, they know what's going on in the Spryfield community, they would be invited to be participants in the grant 
um, donations, you know, making our grant contributions, you know, making sure that those grants are, are built according to the principles and the priority recommendations of the action plan. So that, that would be the role there, is making sure that community have a voice in where the funds are being spent and making sure that they're aligning with the, the Just Food Action Plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Lovelace, have you spoken on this topic? No. No. Councillor Lovelace, that isn't. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thought somebody was ahead of me. Um, so I think what I'm hearing is that, um, you know, we've got a great opportunity to provide um, some leadership. Uh, to uh, collaborate with stakeholders who are engaged in this space, to uh, kind of alleviate um, some pressures that they have uh, in getting some of this uh, work done. We're also hearing, uh, I'm, I'm hearing that there is some uh, commitment coming from provincial government, from federal government uh, on food insecurity, which is great news. Um, I think there was a, a piece in here about uh, the Nova Scotia food and beverage strategy that was mentioned in the report as, um, you know, work that they are engaged in and, and doing that we are a partner uh, at that table, is that correct? Yeah, okay, and but yet when I hear things like, well, only only people supported by their organizations can participate. Well, I would say that that's every advisory and uh, committee that this municipality has. Um, and when I think about the cost of issuing grants, uh, when we already have a grant structure at the municipality that's working very, very well and supporting nonprofit organizations across the municipality and it's quite connected. Um, we've got a phenomenal grants team doing that work already. And I think that what I'm hearing is, is a little bit of redundancy of work that we're already doing in, in many different ways. And potentially what we could be doing is this a little bit better but I'm not, I'm, I'm concerned about future expenditures and redundancy, again, on work that the municipality is already doing, because we already have a wonderful grant system. Uh, so uh, while I sincerely appreciate uh, this work, I am, I am concerned uh, about, what is the word I'm looking for? I am concerned about the, the, the future costs of this program, to be honest, when again we continue to hear that, you know, this this is a, a, a provincial social services initiative. Our food banks are doing incredible work, um, and do they need to be supported? Is do we need capacity building? Absolutely, 100%. We need better. Yeah, I think if you asked anybody who volunteers with Feed Nova Scotia, they would say, yeah, we need more help. We need more bodies. We need more money. Um, you know, food insecurity is a significant issue across this province. But I'm very concerned about the overhead that is sitting inside of this program. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. <clears throat> was Councillor Mancini, were you ahead? Did I bump you out? Councillor Cuddle. I spoke to you. Okay, yeah, the overhead, I think, is, is um, definitely, is definitely the issue here. So, we already have $272,000 in the budget that we found to reduce this from 522 to 250. Is that is that correct if I'm reading the briefing note properly? Uh, there's 500,000 in community safety's budget as proposed. Uh, we've reduced the total budget for it from 857,000 to 750,000. So there's a $250,000 gap between what's in community safety's budget currently and then the what's proposed for the bow today. The bow to fully fund Part B. So, uh, you know, backing up a bit here, you know, we talked about this briefly. You know, when we got the first part of this, the, the part A, right? And I go back and I read that report and I read underneath the financial implications. It's like there are no financial implications at this point. Um, we will come back with part B in the, in the finances, right? Which is what happened. And we came back with part B, which ended up being 1.3, which I think was a, a bit... 1.3 million as, as the overall budget, which is I think what kind of took us, many of us aback, 
because we weren't necessarily saying that by approving Part A that we were going to, you know, kind of uh, fund the Hummer, the Hummer of programs. And it's like, it's like, especially outside of our own core responsibilities, right? I don't think that was that that was really indicated in in the Part A staff report. I mean, it all sounded good, and it still all does sound good. It's just that. You know what is what is our responsibility here? So, I, you know, and it gets confusing because part of this is there's the budget. Part of it already has money in in public safety for the program, and then there's the the gap of that we're looking of 250 in addition to fully fund it. And where I want to get to is I want to say I want to make a motion to say I want to fully fund the municipal-led initiatives that are identified in the plan for the next fiscal year and and then come back and uh, come back and and let us know how that's going and maybe revisit our participation in the food council because I can't take it apart and dissect it right now to figure out what that might look like what an alternative is but um, I do want to support all the municipal-led initiatives so I'm trying to come up with what that number is, and I guess it would be removing any over from the bowel this year because we already have the money in the public safety budget for just food at $500,000. Is that correct? Through the chair to the councillor, yes, the, the 500000 in community safety's budget as proposed would cover the municipally led initiatives would not cover the Food Council and some of the other priority recommendations from Part B. Um, just as, as a point of clarification as well, the number of about 750 to 850,000 was mentioned as part of the staff presentation when Part A came to, to Council back in March of, of uh, 2023. So that number has been floated and has been you know, sort of commonly used as what was anticipated as the cost for delivery of Part B. Right, so um, with that, I'm gonna to try to put a motion on the floor then that the budget committee amend the May motion to remove item BAL 02, the, um, just, Ian, I'm gonna need your help here, the Just Action Food Plan um, from the 24-25 proposed operating budget. Seconded by Mancini, Councillor, District 6. Um, I think I said my, uh, my piece on that, so. <laughs> All right, Councillor Mancini. So, uh, uh, very quickly, you know, I've heard today on a number of topics, uh, you know, staying in our lane, what's in our wheelhouse. Uh, we were talking about food. We did, it was alluded to earlier, I think the, uh, the mayor mentioned about the federal announcement. Uh, you know, I agree, I support the municipally led programs and now it's made clear that the, the, that money's in the budget. So I support those kind of things, mobile food market, the community gardens, all those kinds of things. Uh, my concern is next year, as a number of other councillors said too, what are, we, what are we, we'll be committing to to next year? I think uh, we support the motion that's on the floor. Uh, we come back to the table and see where we are next year, or do we need to go beyond that? I think that's, uh, that's good work. So I support that, Councillor Cuddle. Uh, well done. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, colleagues, so the motion on the floor of Councillor Cuddle and uh, Councillor Smith. Sorry, I got kicked off the list. I'm just wondering if we can get the... Uh, the adjusted number, if we remove this, what would be the impact? Tax yeah, on the tax rate. It would still be 6.3. It's 250 and we, it wouldn't change the tax rate appreciably. Yeah, so, so that's my understanding. So to be clear, this doesn't change the tax rate if we keep this in or remove it. The, the mayor's correct, it does not change. It's yeah, that's what I thought, okay. Thank you very much. I can't support, I can't support that. Okay, so. <clears throat> I think you spoke to it twice. Uh, no, maybe it wasn't the motion then. Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Thanks. Um, just to Councillor Smith's point, it's not just about this year, it's about the following year budgets where we go up to 901.3 million, where it will have an impact on the tax rate. So, um, which is where it kind of all got complicated in all the briefing notes. But that that is part of the main concern here. Um, not not just this year. Thank you. 
Okay, so the motion on the floor of Councillor Cuddle, uh, seconded by Councillor Mancini, <laughs> is uh, <clears throat> that um, we, uh, in essence, that we not fund the $250,000 extra money for just food. Correct, everybody clear on that? Ready for the question. So that motion is carried. So that $250,000 is uh, no longer in the recommendation. Councillor, on the main motion still is amended, Councillor Smith? Oh, that, that must have been when I plug, plugged in for the... You're good? Yeah, thank you. Okay. We are on the main motion. We ready for the question on the main motion? The enchilada, the big tamale. Oh, hold the votes, hold the votes, hold the votes. Send people back to the polling booth. Councilor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can we just have uh, uh, Madam CAO, so where we are on the, the magic tax number. We added, we took away, so where do we stand right now, just so we know we as we proceed. Thank you. We're at 6.3. 6.3%. 6.3. Okay, thank you. So I just want to make sure, Mr. Mayor, thank you. 6.27. 6.3. Anybody else? Okay, ready for the question, colleagues? Well, there you go, folks. That's an anonymous budget. Oh, no, unanimous. All right, uh, that's passed. Madam CEO, Mr. CFO, where do we go from here? Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. So next steps is finance will we'll take this away and we'll have to go and uh, calculate all the, the tax rates and we'll be back on the 23rd for uh, final budget resolution. Okay, um, I would like to thank staff. I'd like to thank Jerry, I'd like to thank our CAO. I'd like to thank these two geniuses over here uh, who manage the uh, books uh, for us, but I wanna thank all of our staff who've been here over the last number of months as we've worked our way through this, fielding questions, giving answers, uh, explaining the connection between uh, money and services and this municipality. Um, I think we have the finest group of public servants uh, that you could possibly have. Uh, and I say that whether I agree with them all the time or not, seriously. Thank you. Colleagues, uh, if Councillor Purdy wants to move uh, adjournment, we're adjourned, we have council next Tuesday. Thank you. No need to show up at nine o'clock in the morning.